right, it is July 7th, 2021. We're in Hollywood, California at Sunset Sound Studio 2. It's 80 degrees in L.A. today, and we're here with Greg Renoff. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Good to have you, Greg. Yeah, thanks for having me in. You are, we've spoke, all of us together, a few different times, and obviously you're the author of the Van Halen Rising book, as well as Ted Templeman at Producers Life and Music. Platinum Producers Life and Music. Platinum Producers Life and Music, which we, Paul and I both have read. Yeah, it's a fantastic book. Thanks. It's amazing. I wanted to give one away that was signed, but they're all sold out. <laughs> Something like that. I, I, we probably can arrange that. We'll, we'll get a restock going, sure. So let's just kick it off with Van Halen. Where were you? What was her name? Who were you with? When was the first time you heard Van Halen? Um, I was probably in uh, my bedroom at home when I probably heard Jump for the first time. But, I, you know, I always say that I almost certainly had heard Pretty Woman on the radio. So this would have been like 1982 when I was in, in – uh, Freshman in high school, but uh, Jump was the one that really connected with me. So I'm a, I'm an '80s high school kid. I was in high school between '83 and '87, so um, I was a little bit too young for the original, these sessions here that were so um, important to Van Halen's career. But uh, yeah, that for me was the 1984 album. Watching Martha Quinn and, you know, introduce Jump, and I'd get all excited. Like you know, we'd gather on the television, then you'd sit there and you'd wait for another hour through all the videos you didn't want to see, getting ready to see the next version of Jump, the next play of Jump, and then pan them up. So that was what made me a fan. Was the 1984 album. That's so interesting um, that that's how you got introduced to Van Halen, but that also is a pivotal time in Van Halen's career, their albums, and obviously in the books. Uh, you write about that period with Ted going up to the 5150 house and uh, all that you know, went on at that time. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's for me, it's, uh, you know, it's a very uh, s surreal feeling you know, to think about when I was a like a teenager, like everyone else watching Van Halen, and then have the honor to do the book with Ted. It was it was incredible, and so yeah, I'm very uh, very much aware of how cool that is. And yeah, it's, yeah, it's exactly what it was like. I was a 14 year old kid, like everybody else, watching MTV and watching Van Halen videos, Hot for Teacher and Panama and Jump, and then yeah, then I got to write the book with Ted. So it was incredible. Those videos. Have you seen the Jump video before? It's incredibly cheesy. yeah, I have. <laughs> it's been a long time though. <laughs> oh, those are amazing. So you're from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Originally, I'm from New Jersey. I live in oh, Tulsa really? now. Yeah, Paul was born in New Jersey. Yeah, he yeah. was. Yeah, so uh, I'm uh, yeah East Coast roots, but I now live in the Midwest in Tulsa. And so yeah, Kane's Ballroom. I've been to that spot. It's a great yeah. It's uh, that's venue. really an incredible, incredible venue. I uh, have uh, seen a number of shows there, and it's uh, the history going back to the 1920s. It's really, really like well, a place like this. When you walk into Sunset Sound, you can feel the history. And the same thing with Kane's Ballroom. You just realize just the the absolute. Um, artist after artist of just incredible stature and when you walk through uh canes especially there's just a whole wall of everyone from uh ray wiley hubbard to to mountain to bonnie Raitt, like anyone you can ever think of has played cane ballroom there yeah. so yeah did the big bands play? yeah there was the, there was the western swing bands that was what the ballroom got to start so it's been uh yeah it, it's been in op operation that long so probably like 80 years or something yeah like. something like that i'm not sure exactly when it opened but it's uh it's like the Palladium. It kind of looks like that layout. I went there with Gary Clark Jr. actually, and uh, beautiful spot. I like Tulsa. Yeah, it's a cool little city. It's been really good to me, so I'm really in like living there. What or how did you uh, get involved with writing the Van Halen book? Were you just keeping notes for a long time? And you're like, wait, maybe I have enough here. No, to it wasn't quite like that. You know, um, so I ended up after college going doing a master's in um, history and then a PhD. I did my PhD, history, PhD in American history at Brandeis University in Boston. And, uh, you know, I wanted a traditional academic history career and I ended up getting a tenure track job and I ended up moving to Missouri and uh, teaching college there. And, uh, you know, I'd always been a Van Halen fan and always as a kind of a release for me, I would look at old issues of Billboard magazine or whatever, just for fun. It, was, it wasn't really connected to what I was normally teaching. I was teaching you know, what you'd kind of consider like, like courses on the Civil War, courses on um, globalization, like typical college history courses. And this was always just sort of a fun aside for me to do this. And uh, I ended up uh, um, remembering and re well, remembering and then reading a bunch of old interviews with Van Halen from Circus Magazine, some other magazines where uh, David Lee Roth would talk about wet t-shirt contests and their backyard parties. And uh, you know, that kind of got me intrigued. And I ended up um, doing a little fishing around on Facebook and I actually ended up talking to a guy who owned a biker bar 
in uh, the Valley called the Rock Corporation it was in Van Nuys. And I talked to him and he was like, oh yeah, you know, we just pack them in, you know, whatever. This would have been in 1975 and you'd pack three, 400 people in this club and Van Halen would play and there'd be a wet t-shirt contest. And so he told me these stories and then, you know, it just started snowballing from there. Initially, um, it was only meant to be sort of a fun little, I was, was thinking like, maybe I'll write something small for Van Halen News Desk. And again, I'm, you know, I'm, um, I'm an assistant professor of history at that time. It was never meant to be like, I never had this master plan, but it just um, became this sort of all consuming thing for me. I mean, I loved Van Halen. I started to realize there's this incredible story here of how these guys met up with David Lee Roth and then really slogged it out for years and years. I mean, that was for me beyond the, the immigrant aspect story, which I thought was really inspirational about the brothers coming to America, not speaking in English and, and um, really achieving the American dream, which I thought was an important part of it. But the other thing was just when I started to realize that everything I knew about Van Halen, and I think most people kind of knew about Van Halen was either some very fuzzy stuff about their early years in Pasadena, and then you know everything after 1978 because of the, um, because that's when they became famous. But then I realized they, they, they were playing in San Bernardino, Pomona, uh, Seal Beach, uh, Venice. Venice, like all over the city. And I started to realize, well, wow, there's this incredible just work ethic story here and how these guys got so good. And that was for me too, what was really um, kind of clear was that how does a band like Van Halen get so good that they can upstage Sabbath on a fairly regular basis? Uh, well, that's become, they played hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shows. And even starting back in Pasadena when the backyard parties when this would have been 74, and I started hearing those stories from locals who really were super helpful to me, a number of the people who, you know, for them, you know, it was it was uh, like a central formative part of their upbringing was seeing Van Halen, like it was their band, and they, you know, they felt part of it. Not like they were part of the band, but they were, you know, we were there when, like, you know, the helicopter came and flew overhead in Pasadena and said, disperse, disperse, and, you know, David Lee Roth waved to them, to wave to the, the cops in the helicopter, and um, those those folks were absolutely instrumental because they started talking to me about their memories of it. You know, so the Van Halen Rising book was meant to be um, an ascent to fame book, but told as much from the perspective as the band, as much as I could from interviews that those guys had done where they talked about it, but also from people who were kind of like a Rodney Bingenheimer or a, a Kim Fowley, and, uh, and also people who were, who were less known, who just along the way, you know, did things to help Van Halen or just were there for their eyewitness parts of it. So, um, you know, when I really discovered that there was this, I don't know, three, five, six year block of time, which really nobody knew anything about, that's when I got motivated to do the book. I was like, well, this is, this is actually pretty consequential. And as we're going to talk about, I think about, you know, how did Eddie Van Halen get so amazing on guitar? How did David Lee Roth develop his stage charisma? All that stuff didn't just sort of magically happen once they got the record deal. That was sort of all there, kind of um, had been baked in the cake from their years of, of playing. Um, all over the place. With the Rock Corporation, I remember Doug Messenger, the great Doug Messenger, uh, that's what he likes to be called. The great Doug Messenger said that Eddie was, had his back to the audience at the Rock Corporation and didn't want people to steal his techniques because when he was 14 years old, the 17, 18 year old kids were coming over to the house to see this Oof. young kid just go absolutely, you know, ham on this homemade rig and. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the stories you hear from people. I mean, I, I heard that less than I expected from people um, about that, but I always thought the thing was that nobody could really probably play it the way Eddie could play it anyway. I mean, that yeah. was the thing that even, the, I, I talked to quite a few guitar players and some who were you know, quite accomplished, uh, who were peers or friends, or, you know, friends or peers of Eddie's, and they sort of were, you know, this kid was head and shoulders above everybody, even like kids who were three, four, five years older. Um, one gentleman in particular told me, I thought was a great, way of thinking about it. He, it's, he saw Eddie, first time he saw Eddie play was around 1971. So Eddie would have been about 16, maybe 17 years old. And he saw them um, at a park in Pasadena. Eddie, Alex, and a bass player named Mark Stone, who was their, their longtime bass player, playing cream songs and uh, on a basketball court. And he said he was watching this kid play. And he said, I've seen guys at the forum, like pro guitar players aren't as good as this kid. This kid's 16 playing on this like blacktop, you know, he said it was just, there was just a, uh, something extra from him even when he was, um, you know, he hadn't developed the two hand tapping or a lot of the stuff we would associate with the Eddie Van Halen style, just the sort of um, left hand of the neck, right hand picking blues type of stuff that would have been like Clapton or Jimmy Page. He said it was just incredible how great he was. Just a trio back then. Yeah, they were just the three, the three no, guys. No singer. 
Uh, Eddie sang. Oh, he sang. Right, Eddie sang. Do you remember the? You know all the clubs around town, and obviously you've lived here a long time. Do yes, you remember so the Rock Corporation? I do. If it's that place, was it off of Woodman? Do you know the street it was on? I can't remember. It was. It yeah. was. It was. Uh, I, I remember it. I just can't remember exactly where it was. There was another place called Walter Mitty's, um, Eros Bogarts, and these would have been places that they would drive like miles and miles and miles. And that there's kind of the Scooby Doo van that Eddie and Alex had to haul their gear in. Um, you know, and they were also playing here in in Hollywood at Gazzari's and then the backyard parties and wherever else they could find to play. But they you know had a real work ethic because those were five forty five minute sets. Mm-hmm. You know. Roth would end the set saying, we're going to take a pause for the cause or whatever, and they go smoke a cigarette outside and drink a beer and then go back and play for bikers. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it was, yeah, it was, you know, it was not exactly uh, glamorous, right? But those guys were uh, committed to their, their craft. And they had uh, like a repertoire of songs. There was like 400 numbers they knew because they'd go to Venice and they'd play Eagle stuff, and then they'd go out in the San Bernardino and play heavier tunes. Um, and they were a cover band. Yeah, and um, a lot of uh, bootlegs of them doing Kiss songs, of all kinds of stuff. They, uh, I, there's uh, Roth talks about this in his biography. It's kind of entertaining, where he would say sometimes, you know, we'd have a request, and I didn't really know the lyrics, but he would sort of scat his way through it, like Scooby Dooby Dooby, and then like there's the chorus, and then like he's like, people are drunk, they don't notice, but you just sort of you know, you're fake your way through it. But yeah, they had a, a tremendous um, repertoire, and that for me, you know, always goes back to the fact that Eddie and Alex, even from the very beginning prided themselves on learning everything note for note. So this would have been in 68, 69, when um, they're f- some of the friends I interviewed for the, um, for the Van Halen Rising book would talk about, they'd see them at you know, like a middle school assembly and they'd be playing monkey songs. And they were like, you know, playing it pretty close to the record. Those guys really were dedicated to the craft. I mean, that was the thing. It wasn't just sort of like, oh, this sounds good enough. But part of the repertoire was they knew, Eddie had an incredible ear and uh, Alex is an incredibly talented drummer. And they, but they also, um, Worked really hard to learn the the, uh, the music. I'll tell you one one funny story. I love to love to tell, which is um, there's a band um, maybe they recorded here. I don't know. Called Captain Beyond. They were sort of a Deep Purple offshoot band. They were kind of a heavy prog rock band. Mm, okay. And they had a they had an album that came out around '72, and um, there was a song on the album called Raging River of Fear, and it was kind of a, um, a six or seven eight minute long song, kind of like you'd imagine like a Deep Purple esque song, and um, Eddie, Alex, and Mark Stone, who had been probably called Mammoth at the time, learned the song. And uh, when I talked to someone who I interviewed for the Van Halen Rising album, he said, like, I was listening to it, and I realized that's not right. And Eddie and Alex never made a mistake. They didn't make a mistake like this. There's something not right about the song. So I went to Eddie after the, after the gig, and I said, Eddie, you guys, what was with the, 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 the uh, Captain Beyond song? It's not right. He goes, yeah, the record had a skip in it. He's like, what? He's like, we only have one copy of the record of the record skip, so we had to make up that part. <laughs> I mean, that's awesome. how they, much they were committed to learning the songs, note for note. So they only had, you know, they could only afford the one copy of the record. They weren't going to buy another copy, and the record had skipped. And so that was, they just sort of like filled that like three seconds or four seconds in because he just said he couldn't understand it because he said they always were so precise on what they did. Captain Beyond, July 1972, at, recorded at Sunset Sound Recorders, go. Hollywood. Oh, it was done here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you know about uh, Sunset Sound in those days? When did you learn about the studio? Oh, yeah. I mean, I knew. I mean, I was a pretty avid reader of liner notes. I mean, I just certainly didn't know anywhere near, you know, I just do a little fragment of what I know now about Sunset Sound from doing the books. But, um, yeah, I had known, of course, the Doors had worked here. I was a big Doors fan. And, and uh, actually, that was, that was the first band I really actually really loved in middle school, the Big Doors revival. If you guys remember, that happened around the time of... Um, the Apocalypse Now movie when, oh, like, yeah. yeah, that big, like, the, the cover of Rolling Stone came, sure. right, so I sort of um, glommed onto that and was, was listening to some of that stuff and um, I had, knew about the studio and then if you, you know, if you read the liner notes and you see, like, Led Zeppelin IV or whatever and stuff, I was, yeah, I was always into the, reading the, I, I wasn't, uh, I had, I even was buying vinyl records even when they were kind of impractical for me personally because, like, the tape, sometimes you'd open the tape, cassette tapes, they'd be so small you could barely read the print, but, um, yeah, nice. Sunset Sound, yeah, I mean, it's like, What's Paul? I've asked you this a hundred times, and I always. Do you remember the first time you saw them? And you know, people don't understand that it's like, how could you not remember Van Halen? There's three bands in here right now. There's might be three, and you were doing daytime and nighttime sessions then. So yeah, it wasn't, we were doing split sessions. Yeah, I mean, would, we do the day sessions, and then we do the night sessions. So we'd have literally a six-band turnover in well, a day. 
So, uh, <laughs> you know, so Van Halen coming in, it was just another, oh, wow, there's a couple young guys coming in to make another record. I mean, they, yeah. you know, they weren't known then. Unless you were hitting the club scene and maybe knew that, oh, that's that band from uh, Starwood or Gazaris or right. something Whiskey. like that. Did you go see them out? Uh, sorry to cut you off. Uh, I don't recall ever seeing them at Starwood. Because you went to Gazaris. I, I went to... I went to the whiskey and the Starwood more than I went to Gazaris, <laughs> but uh, I don't remember seeing them there. Was Gazaris slimy kind of? Or Gazaris was more of a heavy metal place, I think. You know, I don't know. I don't remember going there much. Gotcha. Yeah, my from what uh, I understand about Gazaris, Gazaris was a place that bands that mostly played covers played. So basically, if you played at Starwood, you had to play almost all originals, just like at the whiskey, right? They weren't going to let cover, but so like bands that made their trade on cover songs would be at Gazaris and that's one of the reasons why the big that was the big leap for Van Halen in 76 is that they basically they had enough original songs but they were still making money at Gazaris and they basically had to go to Bill Gazari and say we quit we're going to Starwood yeah. and they, they made that leap to be a quote-unquote all original band where you play you know almost all originals when you play plus you know I recall if I'm right it, you know probably in the early 80s or late 70s that Gazaris with doing the hair bands. Yeah, right. That yeah. would have been like the eight, right? The eight. You know, that's right. And it was I wasn't really into the hair Bill, bands, but that's what right. was playing there. Yeah, I think that really. So um, when I know you guys had Rodney in here, and uh, yes. what a legend he was. Um, when he's talked about seeing Van Halen, I interviewed a friend of his, too, named Hernando Cartwright, who was with Rodney, and he said they were like had left. I guess they had left the whiskey and they were buzzed and they were kind of like walking past Gazaris and like they were just like it was kind of like sound like a raucous crowd and like this loud band and they were let's go in here and like you know, why are we going to go in here? I don't know let's go in and they walked in kind of on a lark. Hernando said it was just almost like on a lark it was just like oh what the hell before we go back to the car let's walk in here and that's when they saw Van Halen for the first time on stage yeah wow. right like, like Dave was doing this you know talking to the girls and sort of had this whole vibe and Rodney was like wow and Rodney talked about how they had a really good following of teenage girls in the room watching Van Halen, kind of watching Dave. And he said like, oh, you know, when the girl, you know, obviously Rodney knows when the girls are into something, they're ahead of the guy. He's like that, they're ahead of the curve. You watch for uh, an artist that can attract a big female following that usually gives you a clue that there's a, you know, there's something really, really good going on there. And that's when they talked to Dave after the show and said like, you know, what's with, you guys play originals? He goes, yeah, we have, you know, of course Roth probably said, we have a hundred originals. I mean, I, they probably had like 20 at the time, but um, you know, he, 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 um, Roth, they were good enough, and Roth was persuasive enough that that's when they went the next, whatever, the Monday, and banged on the door at the Starwood office and said, you got to hire Van Halen. And we'll, we'll you, cut you short, though. Rodney says that he was the one that went to Eddie Nash, and he went to Eddie Nash's office, and he said, I, I have this band, Van Halen, yeah. and that they, they sell a lot of beer to the people, yeah. and the girls love them, yeah. and he's... He, Eddie Nash said, yeah, book him down here because Eddie, because Rodney was DJing at the Starwood. Right, right. Rodney, without a doubt, was the one who banged on the door at the Starwood and basically okay. said, hire. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, said, you uh, got to hire, Van Halen. you, you got to hire Van Halen immediately, like basically. And I, you know, I, the way Hernando told the story was that, um, that at first they were like, I don't like, you know, Gazaris. Why would I, well, you know, why would we want to book a cover band? Basically, like, oh, they got originals and they attract a lot of beer drinking, beer drinkers and girls like them. And so, yeah. So, um, yeah, un unsung hero, Rodney, was really, really a, an amazing figure in the scene that we talked about earlier. And he's just, uh, yeah, he was important. Because yeah, they had played, you know, originally I thought it was just a couple times they'd played Starwood, but they had been playing their years. Yeah, they played there. I mean, I think they played there for... I mean, every couple months they'd play there. Yeah, they played there for several months, and then they, then they made the leap to the whiskey. I mean, the whiskey reopened in the end of 76, you may remember that the whiskey had kind of been shuttered for a while. Yeah, I, I do remember something about that. And so um, one of the things that ended up happening was the, um, was it Mario hired uh, Marshall Burl and maybe someone else to start booking the whiskey. And that's when Marshall, who later managed Van Halen in 78, uh, spoke to Kim and was like, what bands do you like? Kim Fowley and Kim, one of the bands that Kim said, well, there's a band called Van Halen. You should check them out. And that's when... Rodney, uh, excuse me, that Marshall got turned on to Van Halen, but that's when, that would have been when Devo was coming, Blondie, Tom Petty, that was sort of that new wave, yeah. new wave punk revival. So the whiskey reopens and suddenly it's this huge, and Kim was very instrumental with that. Kim, Marshall were the, were the guys who were really getting um, the local acts in there and then getting some of these bigger national acts in there to kind of make the, star, um, the whiskey into a, uh, a big, big venue again. But it had been 
and been closed for quite a, uh, some months or something like that. Devo was, it's, it's funny, all those bands you just listed, even Tom Petty, Rodney broke. Uh, yeah. He was such an effective filter on music to, you know, for everybody. Uh, and he was a journalist, too, that he would write about these bands. Uh, Devo was the big Warner Brothers act at the time. Punk's gigantic in uh, Hollywood. Paul, what do you remember about the punk music in the kind of mid to late 70s? Was that really you, you, It wasn't my it was thing. A flash? I remember, I remember going to CBGB's in New York. Oh, you did yeah. go there? Oh, well, we that. were in there. I think we were there for the AES show. And we had a bunch of, the, you know, some of the staff was with me. And That's we cool. went into CBGB's. <laughs> that was a wild place. But that I think the punk scene was bigger there. Or the punk scene right. here... I wasn't definitely not into it. Okay. It wasn't as big, though, as a lot of people make it out to be. Not everybody in the world was listening to punk at that time. It was disco yeah. and. Disco uh, and rock and roll. Yeah. Um, moving forward, I, we, I've always asked this. Everybody that goes or had went to the shows in those days was blown away by Van Halen. They couldn't believe what they just saw. They're telling their friends about it. What happened with the Gene Simmons scenario? They go to Electric Lady, they cut the demo. Right. Nothing. Do you think Gene? Have you heard? Have you talked to Gene? I've never spoken to Gene. I would love to speak to Gene. Um, so, Gene and Paul were in Hollywood in the summer of '76, and they were staying at the Sunset Marquee. So, I interviewed Jackie Fox, who was in uh, Runaways, mm -hmm. and so he, she and Lita had kind of befriended them, and they had met them, and. Uh, it's, I, you know, uh, Jackie told this great story about how she and Lita snuck into a sound stage. There was some television show that was being shot here, and they sort of got the word that Kiss was there, and they snuck back in, and then they saw them without their makeup or something, and they were like, "Oh, like," and so um, they're like, "They're just regular guys," you know, and so they just sort of like became like, you know, piled onto them, and and uh, Gene started asking them like, "What local bands? I want. We want to start a record label. What local bands do you like?" And he mentioned uh, Gene mentioned a band called The Boys which had members that went on to form a band called Dokken. So it would have been George Lynch. So Dokken um, was on Electra in the 80s and did some, um, you know, some big records and sold a lot of records. But there was another band called Van Halen. And so that's one of the reasons why um, Gene and Paul, along with Rodney, kind of get them. Like basically, Rodney was telling them, you know, what, who do you like, Rodney? Van Halen, you know. And so uh, the girls from The Runaways were saying Van Halen. So Gene goes and sees them. Um, I think he sees them the first night at Gazzari's. He goes and sees them, and he's like, okay, I'll, I'm going to check this band out again. And he goes he goes and checks them out a second time, and that's when he really sees how incredible Van Halen is and then kind of goes backstage with no makeup on and says, I want to take you guys to New York. Um, to answer your question about the, the the reason why the deal didn't happen, you know, I did a lot of work on this in the Van Halen Rising book. Um, so Gene was interested enough that, yes, he put them on an airplane I believe it was the first time Eddie and Alex had ever been on an airplane, I think, and wow. flew them flew them to New York to record Electric, Electric Lady. I wonder why New York. Well, because Kiss was rehearsing at SIR there for... Oh, they were in New York. They were in New York, and okay. they were going to go on tour for Love Gun. And so Gene does the demo with them that's on YouTube. You can hear that, you know, we call it the Gene Simmons demo, or it's just the Electric Lady demo. And um, then... What he also does is he wants to get he wants to get the backing of Bill Coin, who's Kiss's manager, to basically back Gene on this project. I think because they were trying to form a record label and whatever else, so he wants to basically get the company buy-in from his manager. And so um, what ends up happening is that Van Halen auditioned for Bill Coin in New York at SIR using Kiss's equipment. So I mean I don't know how many songs they played. And Nicolian was like, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. And then the story goes the next day, the guys in Van Halen don't have an inkling what the what the verdict is other than Gene's like, you guys did great, you guys did great. And uh, that's when Alcoin famously has them in his office on Madison Avenue and says, you know what, boys, I don't think there's any commercial potential here at all. I don't see any commercial potential. Um, you know, if you guys got rid of your singer, I mean, saying this right to his face, you know, your singer. You know, he's in the room. Yes. Yeah, I don't think, <laughs> he said that Roth talks about how that uh, coin was having his shoes shined at the time. And he said, like, you know, I think you guys are okay. Maybe it's the music's okay, but I don't like the singer. If you know, if you guys maybe wanted to switch out your singer, maybe you might do something, but I don't see it happening. And that was it. And so um, Gene's always said that he basically, he had had them sign up a management agreement or whatever. I don't think it was a record contract, obviously, but it was like a management agreement. And he like tore it up and sent him home. Now, here's where the story really gets interesting is that, so you can imagine 
how devastated this is for those guys. You you have Gene Simmons, arguably the most famous musician in the world. You know, Kiss is at the actually playing Anaheim Stadium. They're huge. Gene Simmons can't get you a record deal, basically, right? You can't, you can't get it. And then so you fly back home with your tail between your legs. What Roth does is he takes this demo tape. Now, he doesn't tell Rodney, oh, guess what? Gene Simmons couldn't get us a deal. I mean, Rodney may have known, he may not have known, but he went and goes, hey, he goes on the radio with KROQ with Rodney and goes, we just did a you know a demo in, with Gene Simmons in New York and it sounds great. Good. <laughs> not being negative, not like, oh, but we didn't get a record deal. It's like, <gasps> how about that work? Me. Van Halen's an electric lady, oh boy. You know, and he does this whole shtick and they play the song on the radio. And so I, I always thought that was like an incredible David Lee Roth moment there where you can imagine like the morale had to be at an absolute pit, right? The absolute bottom after after that. And then you have Dave flip, it, flip the script basically and then able to present this to Rodney. And Rodney's like, oh, because Van Halen. You know, he's all excited and they're playing the, and the song on the radio. And, and, you know, to Roth's credit, I mean, that was a right around the time where things started to change. They got, they, start, they got into the whiskey, they got a higher profile, and not soon after, that's when Marshall makes the call to Ted. Um, but, you know, to give Gene all the credit, and Ted, I've talked to Ted about this many times, he said, you know, Gene's the guy who really discovered them. He was the guy who was there first. And Gene, he's like, I just can't understand why it didn't get pushed over the, the finish line because he said that Gene had his finger on it. He saw he saw what I saw, basically. Gene saw the same thing. I saw the talent and the, the potential. And uh, he said that, um, you know, it was uh, important also for him because he sort of had, um, you know, he was able to listen to the demo tape that Gene had, uh, had done with those guys and go, oh, here's like, here's a song. So it was basically a very good um Starting point for Ted as they were to work on putting the album together. They had 10 or 12 songs that had already been laid down. They had some, he had some like, oh, I like this song, I don't like this song as much or whatever, and had some ideas. Of course, the big difference was um, Gene wasn't connected to a record company. Right, right. Whereas Ted, he had all, himself and then all the guys. Right, right. Ted could get Mo Austin to come down yeah. the next day and sign the deal. There you, you go. Um, and I, I think it was Gene who, who had basically figured out later, I could be wrong. That was that was that Al Coyne, Whether whatever Al Coyne thought about Van Halen, they could have brought Led Zeppelin in there, and he wasn't going to sign them because he didn't want Gene to get distracted. Like basically, Gene wanted to have like Apple Records, like the Beatles had Apple. He wanted to have like I don't know, like Peach Records for the Kiss, where it would be like their own private label on Casablanca. And from what I think, Gene, I think it's Gene. I could be wrong. Gene or maybe Paul said that they didn't want. I should think about it, maybe it was Paul that they didn't want Gene to be like become like, oh, I'm a, I'm a record mogul now and Kiss becomes second or whatever, right? you know, so. Okay, so put the I focus on the band. Keep the focus on the band, so they sort of torpedoed it, but um, mm. yeah, such, it's such is history, right? And wouldn't, they wouldn't be worked, worked in here. David Lee That's Roth right. is a giant networker for him. He's getting him the gigs at Gazaris. He's driving all over. They're all doing the flyers, everything. He's the one that takes the initiative to go to K-Rock. Do you think that's a big part of why Van Halen kept him in the group at that point? I mean, because everyone's like, you got to fire your singer. Yeah, I mean, I think that that stuff probably start, stopped pretty early on. I mean, I think in terms of like, oh, you mean about record executives? Yeah, I mean, I think th those, whatever negativity was being sent the way of Dave from people who saw Van Halen, I mean, I think there was probably also going to be a contingent of, of um, record executives who would have said, Eddie is too wild in his playing. I mean, there's, there's this sort of, um, I think largely true narrative that pretty much everybody in Hollywood had sort of seen or knew about Van Halen because they, you know, you would drive by Gazaris and it said Van Halen, Van Halen, Van Halen for years. And people, there were, you know, people had sort of either thought they knew what Van Halen was or had seen Van Halen. Um, and so I think, yes, I think there was definitely a probably n known to the brothers that there were people in the industry who had seen Van Halen and thought Roth was the weakest link of the group. Um, but that being said, you know, I think they, I think they were loyal to each other. I mean, I think that was the thing. I mean, that was the Alcoin message was basically, if you want to dump your, dump your singer, I mean, you know, but, um, they'd been together a long time at that yeah. point, four or five years, four years. Well, even Ted tried to talk him out of the 25% each four ways. He's like, guys, you're not four equal parts, but they, they said, no, we're brothers four ways. We're splitting everything four ways. Yeah. So that's the, that's the story where, um. So right before they finalized their deals at Warner Brothers, there was the question of how you were going to split the writing credits. And um, Ted advised the four members of Van Halen not to do a 25% split. He's just basically like, divide the money another way. You know, um, 
you know, if you want equal equal shares for everybody, let's think of a different way. We should you should think of a different way to divide the money up, but don't do this because it's going to cause problems down the road. Um, but they, you know, yeah, they, they Ted said they all were like we're brothers, we're in this together, and he's like, okay, um, it did cause problems later down the road with some um, issues with writing credits, but. Um, you know, Ted said he probably used the example of the Beatles, like, you know, basically like the Lennon and McCartney didn't yeah. like give Ringo a writing credit because he was in the, you know, in the general vicinity when they wrote a Love Me Do or something like that, you know. Um, but, but, um, though they, uh, you know, it worked for a long time. I mean, that was the thing about Van Halen. It, the original, it worked for f- four or five, you know, six years, eight, seven years until it imploded. But um, even after it had the, had the deal, right? One thing I wanted to ask you uh, to backtrack a little bit, your research is so extensive for your book, but you had even interviewed neighborhood, well, neighbors of the Van Halen mm-hmm. family over in Pasadena, right. and people had said that they would see Eddie Van Halen's guitars hanging from the clotheslines, and he'd be back there striping them. Um, that's an amazing story. Can you... Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I did 230 interviews for Van Halen Rising, and wow. that was done over a period of about, I don't know, three or so years. Um, I would get on the phone with somebody, and uh, then I would, you know, I would tape record the interview, and then I'd transcribe it. Um, and a lot, yeah, so, you know, it was it was a matter of just when I would get on the phone and talk to people, I would say, who else should I talk to? And they'd introduce me to somebody else. And so, yeah, a guy actually by the name of um, David Shelton is the guy who told me that. He was a Pasadena guitar player. He still plays around L.A., very good guy. And, um, you know, Eddie was, Eddie. you know, for all the, the sort of the stories that you hear about Eddie was like turn his back to the audience. There was a number of guys I talked to who just, Eddie was, you know, especially younger kids, like mentor them sort of. And this kid was like 16, 17 years old, not a kid, but David was like 17 years old at the time. And he used to, kind of stop over the house and he's you know like stop and he would go and find eddie in the backyard and like eddie would be painting his guitars or um just he would you know actually uh eddie taught him how to play some of the van halen songs and stuff and so yeah i mean that's the thing that's really amazing about the van halen story is if for anyone who's ever been past the house at las lunas i mean it's it couldn't be more different than the house that roth lives in now i mean like roth was living his father owned uh, the mansion over there in Pasadena, the huge mansion on Bradford, um, and the Van Halens are living in a two-bedroom, tiny, you know, uh, post-World War II little track home. Track home, yeah. yeah. I mean, on Las Lunas, and so that's what I think. That was the other thing that was um, interesting to me as a historian was that contrast between Roth, whose father was an ophthalmologist and was very successful and had money, and then you know the, the Van Halens, who were you know basically like you know very work middle class, working class real salt of the earth people. And so, yeah, that, you know, there was no workshop to go to. It was like you paint them in the garage and you, that this uh, gentleman, David Shelton, told me that Eddie would put the, the clothes hangers and hang them from the tree, like literally hang them from a tree or hang them from his mother's clothesline to dry in the sun. You know, he's repainting his guitars. So, yeah, it's, it's an amazing story. So Ted Teppelman, obviously we know the story. He comes to Starwood, is immediately blown away by Ed, calls the execs down, they go upstairs, right. sign something on a napkin, um, and bring him in this room and do 25 tracks, 10 rolls of tape. Amazing. What do you think at that point, after spending so much time with Ted, obviously he's a great guitar player. He's very iffy about Dave. What was the branding that he thought was going to sell? How was he going to market this group? Because he was also a producer and obviously a VP at, was he a VP at Warner yeah. Brothers? Yeah, he was a VP, VP at, at Warner point, Brothers. Yeah. What do you think he saw in them other than the talent from ed and there's a chemistry going on but how was he going to brand them in this kind of weird age in music right and you know so when ted talks about seeing van halen for the first time he talked about it first he said it was almost like falling head over heels in love with a girl like you saw ed and it was just like oh my god this guy is so incredible um ted thought it was his playing the way he soloed was almost reminiscent of the uh, bebop jazz players that ted had grown up as a trumpet player in my Charlie Parker, he's talked about this and sort of that for Ted, he said that was what connected for me. He said, I, I saw this group that was trying to do these, they were playing these like, you know, quasi poppy hard rock songs with this guitar player who was almost like fusiony in how he played. Um, so, but when he signed the group, I think that was where Ted had to really start to think about how to make this come together. And so that's part of the reason why I think the 25 song demo was done was he was, you know, they didn't play everything they knew, but he basically was like, okay, play me your best 25 songs. And that's what they did. They came in here and they played everything from uh, Running With The Devil to Happy Trails. They played You Really Got Me. They played Voodoo. Like basically much of the material was on the first, 
I mean, actually stuff that was from all all six Van Halen records, if I recall correctly, but certainly a lot, the mo uh, a lot of the stuff from the first two records. And so then, then it was a matter of thinking about what's going to make this band tick. And I think what ended up clicking for Ted was, among other things, was that he and Dave really had a very similar conception of what Van Halen was, I think, and was going to become, which was that Ted always talked about how he and Dave, even if, like, again, Ted had some questions about Dave's singing, he said, you know, we had basically the same record collection. We all loved the Motown stuff, the Stack stuff. He said, like, when I could talk songs with Dave for hours, like, he'd be like, oh, yeah, he knew all that stuff. And a lot of kids, a lot of guys his age didn't know that 50s stuff the way that Roth did. And so when Ted said when he heard Van Halen, he heard this incredible earth-shaking, world-changing electric guitar playing that he thought was so incredible that he wanted to share with the world. But he said he also heard um, a real pop side of things where, for example, maybe an underappreciated part of that would be Michael Anthony's vocals. He said that when I would hear them, they did the harmonies with Mike and Ed together. He said, it sounded like the Beach Boys to me. You know, like, I feel your love tonight. He said there was like this real pop thing. And he said they were, and they, those guys were so upbeat and so happy. He said they were just like, you know, they weren't, a heavy metal group like Deep Purple or like Alice Cooper. You know, they weren't like a dirgy. They were like, obviously they were kind of like a hard rock or heavy metal group, but he said they were much more upbeat. And he said, I wanted to make it sort of a, he, he called it like a sun-kissed California hard rock thing, which is what Ted tried to do with Montrose. Mm -hmm. And I mean, tried to do meaning that that was this, like he said, Ronnie and I had talked about this, about, you know, instead of doing the six minute hard rock song let's do three minute songs and just make these incredibly short but kick-ass guitar solos and these super powerful riffs like on the Montrose record that record didn't really sell all that much out of the gate and so that's kind of where the the blueprint for that kind of started and then Ted um, and Dave I think were able to sort of um, see their way forward that and I don't mean that they those guys like sort of like sat down and reshifted everything but there were some songs that were kind of if you listen to the 25 song demo there's a song called um, like Light in the Sky, Peace of Mind. There's a couple of songs that are more like moody. They're like minor chords. And it's, it's not the sort of party rock, clap along Van Halen stuff, which is, you know, Ted's like, it was good, but it really wasn't what I wanted Van Halen to be. I wanted, I wanted some dark stuff on the record. I wanted Running with the Devil. I wanted Atomic Punk. You know, but I also wanted the Jamie's Crying the Feel Your Love Tonight, the You Really Got Me stuff that sort of was a, was a um, uplifting thing. Van Halen anthems. Right, right, part, like a party type of thing. Paul and I discussed that before. I think my notion is that Ted didn't ever, never moved into singles territory with Montrose, so he wanted to get it right this time. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. I mean, that was the thing that, that um, you know, one of the things I really learned from the book with Ted, and I can only really speak for Ted's perspective on this, is that Ted you know, felt an enormous, as, as, been, as in, having been a recording artist himself at Harper's Bazaar and having been on the, um, the other side of the glass and knowing how it felt when you worked hard on a song and it didn't do very much. I mean, Ted had the experience of, the, he did the song with Lenny Warrenker, with Harper's Bazaar, the Feeling Groovy song, which was a big hit. So their first song was like this top, here. top 10 song, yeah, tracked here, yeah, top 10, uh, I think that was Western, there was some stuff tracked here, but um, top 10 hit. Feeling and then after, the, that, after that, it was like, they never really, they never really retained that level. And I think for Ted, he always took it really hard for his artists when they didn't, they didn't sell. And he said that I was, you know, I really thought Ronnie had, and you know, Sammy had done this incredible record, Danny Carmasi, there's such a great record and it didn't sell. He's like, it just but would bother me so much. And he said, I, my mistake was that I didn't put, a, I didn't find a song that was a good enough single for them. And that was the reason why Ted was supported and wanted You Really Got Me put on the Van Halen debut. That was a song they were already doing. Ted said when he saw them at the Starwood, they did You Really Got Me that night, but he wanted that because he said, you know, it's like, look, it's, it was kind of, it was already a, a, an established song and people, record, um, the record uh, executive like Ted knew that uh, DJ would be probably be more likely to give a song like, oh, You Really Got Me, that's a good song, let me give this band a chance um, out of the gate rather than sort of like, who's this band Van Halen? They're playing this music that's kind of out of fashion. So, um, yeah, he he definitely felt as if that he didn't do the proper calculations with, with Montrose, even though that record now is considered to be like sold two million copies and considered to be sort of a an, an ultimate classic. But yeah, that's funny because you really got me. Was the first Van Halen song. 
put on a playlist at K Rock. Yeah, that makes sense, right? That would have been that would have come out in yeah you know, February or March 1970. Of course, and that's the thing. Like David already built the rapport with Rodney, and he knew those guys. And so yeah, like I say, Rodney was uh, was there before it even even happened, um, and saw it. I mean, he saw the potential too. So the, you know, that's the thing about the Van Halen story too. There were people for all the people who were like, oh, it's just another rehash of Led Zeppelin, and this this music's over. I mean, that's kind of was the narrative for a lot of these record executives. They would see this band like, ah. Oh, you know, uh, disco's big now, soft rock, the Eagles are big, Linda Ronstadt's big, right? And it's sort of like, it's over, and punk is coming now from the UK, and punk's the next big aggressive thing. There were, there were some people like Rodney who saw, you know, could see, see through that. Speaking of Montrose, there's a great interview with Denny Carmasi that Dweezil and I did. It's up on our YouTube, if anyone's interested. He's an amazing drummer and a great story. How did you get in touch with Ted? How did I get in touch with Ted? Well... That's a good question. Ted. He read the Van Halen Rising book? Because there's well, tons of books on Van Halen. I talked to, well, I talked to Ted um, in, while working on the Van Halen Rising book. I actually ended up contacting um, a journalist who had written an article about actually the, the passing of Ronnie Montrose, if I remember correctly. Ronnie un unfortunately committed suicide. And um, this journalist had written a nice tribute to Ronnie. And I wrote to her and I said, how did you get in touch with Ted? I'd love to talk and work on this book on Van Halen. And she said, oh, just write to the Doobie Brothers. So I wrote to the, like, you know, info at doobies.com. And, and the uh, person who was running there, whoever runs their office, like forwarded it along to them. That's how. But yeah, they're, oh. yeah. Interesting. <laughs> That's how I got in touch with Ted. Incredible. So, um, and I, you know, I got, I, he emailed me back. And, and I said, I just want to talk about, you know, the, fir the first Van Halen record. He said, oh, okay, great. Give me a call. And, you know, and then he, he talked to me and it was, it was awesome. I mean, it was just, yeah, he was, um, very, um, you know, very nostalgic in a good way. And it was like, you could tell it was this inc incredible, I mean, beyond the record sales, just how much he loved working with Van Halen, that it was like, you know, one of those things that really sticks with you for your whole life. It was just like such a great experience working with those guys. So he was, you know, it was, it was you could tell it was easy. He loved talking about it, it was fun. Uh, Ted originally comes into Sunset Sound. Was it Feeling Groovy the first time he had came into Sunset? He had produced an album before that? I don't know. No, he, he came he in. Uh, I, I know, he came in for, um, so Feeling Groovy was done at Western, I believe. And then when, I, I think that I'm 100%, right. I'll bet you 10 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I know it was. But go well, ahead, carry on. So when Ted came into Sunset with Leon Russell, which I think was the first time, I could be wrong, I think that was the first time, they did um, two songs called, uh, Raspberry Rug and something called um, Listen to the Darkness or I, I Can Feel the Darkness or something. Those were done for the Harper's Bazaar record. So the first, what ended up happening was Feeling Groovy came out as a single, mm -hmm. as a standalone single back in the day, right? You put out a single and if it bombs, well, guess what? The record company hasn't spent any money. But because Feeling Groovy did well, um, Lenny calls in the guys from Harper's Bazaar and says, we're gonna make a record and then gets the wrecking crew in here. And so like Glenn Campbell and Carol Kay and all these people and, um, Leon come in and they, they work, among other places at Western, they worked here. At least, that's as far as I know, they worked the session. The Leon session was done here at Sunset. Okay. When is the first time you met Ted Templeman, Paul? Do you remember around what time? Well, I think I met him through Don Landy. Because um, the engineer was always the first in and the, and the last out. So when I was, you know, Maybe I'd bounce in the studio. I would see Don first before the session would start. Producers weren't necessarily here right at the downbeat. I mean, or right at the setup, setup time. So it's got to be late 70s, you know, like 76, 77 is when so I met him. Sorry, when they came in here. Yeah. So I didn't meet him. Prior to that, I didn't meet him on the early uh, Little Feet stuff. I, I was too young then. So that's probably about the time. And Don Landy, which Peggy McCreary and yourself had mentioned, he was just a whiz. He knew everything. He was giving you suggestions on gear to buy. Oh. He was one of the, the top engineers that worked here. And his girlfriend ran your other studio, the traffic desk at uh, Sound she, Factory? She did. She did. She, um, yeah, Gail. She, she ran our... <laughs> 
our traffic department over there. What a time. So what's the, tra- what's the traffic department? Well, the traffic is, we call it traffic. It's, it's the people who book the studio. I see. I so see. it's, you know, all the traffic goes through them. I and get it. So, you know, they, they book the sessions, they book the engineers, they book the assistants. I see. So like they that. have to make sure there's not a double booking and someone's showing up. And, right. right. Yeah, right. it's what yeah. Phil does now. That's the traffic office in there. Yeah. Shout out cool. Phil McConnell. Um, so Ted speaks so highly of Sunset Sound in the book, mm-hmm. which was so nice. And Paul finished the book. I've read it. He loves Studio One, and that's where he wants to do Van Halen One. Yeah, so um, Ted, that's my recollection, is that when Ted worked with Leon, now that I think about it, they worked in Studio One. Mm. Um, the echo chamber was used on a lot of that stuff, and that Ted said that all the stuff that he heard coming out of Sunset and his recollection of working in there was that that room had a certain ambiance to it. He said, he described it, his metaphor was like, it was almost like walking on ice. Like you'd walk, you'd think you were doing, you were going just fine and then suddenly you something would slip. And he said that that was what made it exciting is that you, this, he said, um, rooms like Amigo were EQ'd very flat. Like it was basically like, you kind of knew, it was very predictable, room, kind yeah. of predictable, right? And that, that was a much liver room. And it was also, he said, you, you didn't always know what you were gonna, gonna get. And so the first thing that they did, Don and um, Ted did, was Cold, Cold, Cold in Studio One, where they put um, they put a, a riser, and they had um, Richie, I think it was Richie Hayward, on the drum riser, and they created that huge drum sound for Cold, Cold, Cold. Because that came out so well, that's when they went back and they did Rock Candy in the same room a year later with um, Denny. Yeah. But Rock Candy was done in this room. Well, 100%. Danny Carmassi told me this. Oh, he did? Yes. Okay, well. I'm going to disagree on that. I'm going to disagree. disagree I'm going to disagree strongly on that. I just, I, yeah. Unfortunately, I don't have the invoices going back that far, so I can't tell you exactly. But so you got to talk to the I, guys on I, it. I, yeah, I, yeah. Well, Denny's mistaken. Can we just get something out of the way right now? Paul talked to Ted on the phone a, th- a couple months ago. Paul, or Ted seems to think Eruption was done in two. We've always thought Eruption was done in Studio One. Can we get that clarified? Sh- well, um, if you look at the tape boxes, it says one. I mean, could the tape boxes be wrong? But I, I would never, I would never suggest that Don Landy made a mistake on the tape boxes. In all no, seriousness, no, but they would flip, you know. So these sessions weren't always, you know, back in the day or even now. You know, uh, they start a record and they they do some of it in, so they, they maybe they start it in Studio yes. One, right. and then they run out of time or they decide to do something in another room right. different. Right, so and, they go to two. Yeah. But right. the tape box doesn't change. In all in all seriousness, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, th- I think the tape. Don remembers Studio One. This tape box is Studio One. So, in all seriousness, I think it is Studio One. And so, yes, that Don and Ted don't remember why they got bumped out of Studio Two or they moved. But basically, the last two days of tracking, which would have been September seventh and uh, uh, September seventh and eighth, I think, of nineteen seventy eight are in Studio One, and the picture that Don took, that great picture shows them in Studio One, and that's when um, Eruption and Jamie's Crying, which was one of the last, that was written in, in that room. Um, and oh, wow. the, uh, if you look at the tape boxes, which is kind of interesting too, that, um, which I was able to access when I did Van Halen Rising, is that there's, um, it says guitar solo. Guitar on, solo. And then it's like, right, you're like, well, you're I've, got the Im- I've got the invoice. And then there's like, and it says guitar solo. Yeah. And it says Studio One. Yeah. So when I'm talking to Ted, I was really adamant about this. And I said, hey, you got to talk to me about the eruption thing. And he goes, okay. I go, what room do you remember that being done in? And he goes, Studio Two. I go, well, wait a minute. That's not what, that's not right. what I've been told. Right. And I know you were there, but, you know, the, the, bo- the, the invoices say I Studio mean- One. And he goes, no, no, I remember. It, it would Studio be very, two. It would be very hard so, for me to break. I, listen, I don't know. Listen, I, I think Ted has an excellent memory, and it's very hard for me to break that tie. The only reason why I'll or he's I'll, flipping the name. I'll the give numbers. Maybe, I don't know. I'll give him. I'll give Don the benefit of the doubt on this one, is because the tape box does say one, right? So that's the thing. So Don the remembers invoice one, says one, and the tape box says one. So yeah, but um, yeah, um, amazing. I mean, that's where Ted sort of talked about how he was like heard it and was like, "What's that?" You know, <laughs> just What's something that? I warm up on or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Get the tape rolling. And Don was already rolling the tape, right? Which yeah. is the, that's the classic Ted Templeman, uh, Don Landy story, where Ted kind of walks in like, "Roll, we got to roll tape," and he's like, "I'm already rolling." Like, yeah, you know, he already had already, already like going. three steps ahead. He already saw that Ted was all animated and wanted this thing on tape. So amazing. Don was very vocal about replacing Dave at the beginning as well. 
Well, I wouldn't say vocal, man, because I don't think Don's ever been really been vocal <laughs> about anything in terms of. But I think he was. I think the way that Ted explained it to me is that Don was very, very subtle and quiet about how he said things, but also could hear that there were. I mean, there were basically Dave was not a traditional singer. I'll say that that he had an orthodox way of singing, and that he had not um, going to be something that basically the way he sang on the demo that Ted would say, said, this is just not going to be acceptable. Not like, this is not acceptable, you're fired. But basically, if this is going to work, I have to think about how to make this work. And that's where Ted said, in the, um, I think in the, the, the biography I did with him, he said, you know, Van Halen was like this incredibly difficult arithmetic problem at first. Like, you like, you, algebra problem. And you're like, you know it can be solved, but you have to really think about it. And he sort of tried to, to think his way through it about how to, to basically, to, among other things, to coach Dave in a way to make the things that Dave did well shine on the record. The screams, the sort of the, all the stuff that we, you know, the identify, like Ted would say, identifiability is the most important thing in some ways where it comes to a, a vocalist, is that you can have, Ted gave me this great example, he said, you know, I could bring 100 Broadway singers in through here and we would go, they're amazing, like all of them, but he's like, he wouldn't remember any of them maybe, because like, they're all just sort of, they don't have a certain character, to the, they don't have the Dylan, the Jagger, the David Lee Roth, yeah. something. And he said, that's what he said, that's what Dave had is that he had, among other things, he had identifiability. It's something very unique in the way he did things. Um, and so, yeah, I, you know, I think Don was just like, kind of like, you know, I think, I, I hate to speak for Don, but I think Don was from like, I don't know, if, <laughs> just kind of, you know, you're, you're, you, there's, there was a certain level of um, rock singer around in the 70s. I mean, you can think about any number of them and you just sort of can look and just kind of initially you're like, I don't know if this is gonna work. Um, he suggested Sammy, though, didn't he? He said, you got to get Sammy. Yes. So, yes. So Ted and Don were sort of mulling, like kind of, you know, maybe muttering to each other over the behind the board and sort of like, yeah, we could get Sammy. Um, you know, and that was something that never got off the sort of off the ground, right? That was the, I think, I've heard Sammy say different things about that. But from what I learned from Ted, it was that it never came to anything more than those guys sort of like going, I don't know, like, what are we going to do? But Ted said that when he would used to go, you know, he was thinking about how to work with Van Halen. He used to go out to Roth's house and watch their rehearsals. This would be in the basement of the Roth house over in Bradford. And uh, he said that, you know, he's like, Dave was like super smart. And, you know, I realized there were things that I, he's like, you know, Ted was a vocalist himself and said, I realized that there were things I could do to sort of help, help accentuate his strengths. And he said, you know, the lyrics and the, the sense of humor. And he's like, you can't just... You know, it's not just a matter of like pulling something out of a band and then plugging something back in. He's like, you know, it, and and Ted's one of the things that Ted said to me a number of times. He said, if I had pulled Dave out of that band in 1978, I would have made the biggest mistake in rock history. He said, I would have destroyed the best band that he said, arguably one of the you know best bands in the world. I would have destroyed by doing that. Not that Sammy's not great, but he said there was a certain you know the Ed and Dave chemistry that was you couldn't just plug a, a great rock singer in there and expect that that same thing was going to be there. Plus, you said that he was a good writer. Yes, that, right. For so, the band. Yeah. yeah um, <clears throat> he had that ability. You know, Ted said that he would read his lyrics and go, wow, this is really some pretty um, deep stuff. He said, like, you know, he said one of the lines he remembers that stuck with him was said, if you want, you got to bleed for it. And he was like, you know, he's like, I just thought, like, wow. He's like, that's super intense. And they said, you know, that was the type of stuff that Dave would come up with these lines. And he just said that for him was a selling point as well. It's like, there's... There's an intelligence there. And he said that, you know, he said like, he said Roth was, um, I'm sure he still is. He's the type of guy who could go for about talking about, a, a you know, a Archie's comic book, just talking about Tolstoy in the same sentence. And you'd be like, well, what? And then you realize, oh, it all kind of makes sense. Like he said he was just a superior intellect. And he said that doesn't, you know, you can't just find that. You're not going to find like some guy, you know, audition 100 guys and find guys like that. And he said, so that was the, you know, he, when he sort of backed off, from it and said, okay, so he's pitching on some notes or he's not doing things the way I would necessarily want. And again, and in fairness to Ted, and I think in fairness to Dave, Dave's never presented that, uh, pretended that he was Michael McDonald, right? So this is like, you know, Ted's working with like Nicolette Larson and Michael McDonald and like, you know, all of these incredible, <laughs> he's like, you know, sort of world-class vocal talents and you've got kind of, kind of more or an orthodox singer. So, um, you know, I think that's where Ted sort of like had to widen his, his focus on the band and say there's more more to that than just like whether the guy is going to be, you know, um, an opera singer. Yeah. I think his personality, he really, as 
stated in your book, he really enjoyed spending time with Dave. He loved Eddie a lot, but he really liked Dave. This history of music, like you said, was very similar. They loved the doo-wop. And, um, yeah, he always, I mean, I think the thing was that he always said that he had a, a great rapport with, with all the guys. I mean, he said at the beginning especially, you know, it was like this, it was just always fun. He said um, for him to work with the guys in Van Halen. But I think, like you're mentioning, yeah, that's a great point about the song knowledge that for whatever reason Dave had it was the type of guy who grew up listening to a lot of the same stuff that Ted had grown up listening to um Ted you know growing up in Santa Cruz used to listen to a lot of Motown a lot of stack stuff and Dave knew all that stuff inside and out and he said that was you know that was a real in terms of when we talk about you know arrangements and stuff like that that was part of what made it easy to work with with Van Halen and with Dave is that you know Dave understood what I was trying to trying to do was to make those guys have you know, keep the arrangement short and sweet and make it a pop structure. Do basically heavy, what would have been called heavy metal in the 70s in a pop song format. And that's what really Van Halen pioneers. Yeah, you know, in your book, it made it sound like as time evolved that Ted be, had a lot more respect for David. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. From the initial, you know, meetings. Oh, yeah. Oh, and, yeah. And he changed his mind. Yeah. And tuned completely. Yeah. And I think, you know, and I think it again, I think that's, you know, at the time, in 1977, what's really interesting to think about, because we were talking about this earlier, is that you have someone like Ted, who, he, so he signs Van Halen with Mo Moss, and they sign him, and they're working on finalizing the deal, and whatever, they finalize it around March, and they come in back in April. I don't even know how many times Ted would have been around those guys. I mean, it wasn't like Ted was spending every day with Van Halen in between signing them and doing the demo. He was doing... Um, he was doing the Doobie Brothers. He was doing Fault Line here. So he was in here and, you know, he's um, doing sessions at Sunset, sessions at Amigo. He's flying to meet with artists in New York. And so I would imagine as much as he was excited about Van Halen, it wasn't as if he had a lot of time to explore it. So then he's suddenly like, okay, here's the audition. You know, they already signed them basically. And here's the, you know, here's the, here's the demo. Let's, let's hear what they have. And suddenly it's like, oh, I don't know. Like, I don't know if this is going to work. But then Ted said that, you know, he started to get into the trenches with those guys and started going to rehearsals. And again, the timeline's kind of fuzzy. I mean, you're not going to remember exactly when you started that. But it was certainly after the demo was done in April, Ted said, I started to spend a lot more time thinking about the songs with those guys. You know, I wanted to do the record and started to think about which songs should we do. And of course, the record isn't done. This is a funny thing, too. I said to Ted, one of the first conversations I said to him, I said, well, you know, I was proud of myself. I said, okay, you, you know, you signed them in February, basically, because I was able to kind of figure that out through my research, which was always had been a fuzzy detail. And I said, you, you, didn't, um, you didn't record them until August, right? And Ted's very nice, right? You know, some people would have been like, hey, dummy. You know, I wasn't just like sitting around thinking about Van Halen. He's like, oh, he was like, I was, and he wasn't bragging. He's like, I was very busy. He's like, you know, he's like, yeah. I was like, he's like, I was an executive at Warner Brothers. He's like, I go to these meetings and, you know, I'm like, you know, driving home late at night and you know so he, you know he sort of like made clear to me like oh like you know he had like three acts like Nicolette Lar like he had all these acts going right like right he's like I'm signing Nicolette Larson and stuff and so you sort of realize that that was part of it probably where suddenly Van Halen's on his radar now he's like okay I got to figure this out and then suddenly he starts to go and spend a lot of time with Roth and yeah I mean I think the more time that went on um you know this, this stuff from uh you know fair warning and and he talks about the stuff in 1984 just the the uh the lyrics and uh you know how important dave was to writing melodies as well i mean he says you know he said that you know a lot of times um people have a popular conception of a song being like well if someone writes the instrumental parts to the song they've written the song just generically like oh they've written a song but if you don't have um you don't have lyrics and a melody you don't have a pop song and he's like so you know um he said you know sometimes ed would come up with a melody there'd be a melody built into what ed had written but other times it'd be just sort of these chords and then dave would take it um, and make a song out of it and um, finish it off, basically. And he said that partnership was so, so amazing. You have these great lyrics and just Dave's um, musicality and creativity. Yeah, and that's, that's why he didn't want the band to split. I mean, that's kind of the other end of the story, right, where he was like so in love with the, the Van Halen band that it was that he didn't like what it was going to become, which was something, something different. Again, I, I want to ask Ted sometime how he wanted to market that band though i just uh, there's a great answer in there it's not a simple answer it wasn't a metal band it wasn't a songwriting band there was some magic there and it's what everybody knows that's why van halen's so big and i'd love to hear it from his mouth yeah i don't i don't i mean i don't know you know how um 
how much he would have been involved with that. I mean, I think there was guys like Ted Cohen and these other guys who were sort of more involved with the the marketing of the bands at Warner Brothers. Um, I would I would say that I think Ted saw them as a hard rock group that played pop songs. I mean, I know that we've already talked about that, but I don't think there was ever like a magic. I mean, that's sort of the I you know I think the one thing that's interesting about that on that point is that there was an original Van Halen album cover done. You guys may have seen it. It's on on the internet that was sort of more like, I call it the punk rock logo. It was much more of like the, it, it didn't have the sort of the, the uh, Dave Bang Wings logo, which is sort of the classic Van Halen logo. It was much more like of a, there was a black and white photo and it's more like a Sex Pistols Clash, like the Clash first Clash album. And they hated that um, and ended up scrapping that. So, you know, whatever marketing you can kind of look on the album cover, to me, it's like, I always thought that was like the photos in that album cover were so great. I, Elliot, what's the photographer's name is escaping me, but you know, sort of those guys sort of like having the wash of color on them and in the back they're like kind of soaked in sweat like from performing. It's like I thought that was like kind of captured the energy of the band really, really well on the album cover they finalized. Sunset Sound has a great relationship with Warner Brothers. Tons of Warner Brothers acts in here. Prince obviously is in mm-hmm. Studio 3. Do you think that Ted was just so used to working in here or did he also want to incorporate the room as the kind of fifth element of Van Halen. He knew about the echo chambers. He knew about the drum sounds from Montrose. Right. Yeah, I think Did Ted mention anything about keeping the guitarist away from the amps a lot? Or do you, technically, did he speak about any of that? I mean, I think I think what Ted I was, to. was um, you know, he did a lot of stuff at Amigo, which was Warner Brothers Studio. And I, I think he always said whenever he could work at Sunset Sound, he tried to. Um, so the one record that was um, we talked about a little bit earlier was the Carly Simon record. I'll come back to that in a second. But I can only tell you that um, he really did emphasize to me that there was something unique about the sounds that he could get us in Studio One. And, and also in this room in Studio Two, the thing he would talk about, he loved this room because he'd put the drummers in the corner. So whether it was Little Feet or Van Halen, Alex would be in the corner, Richie Hayward would be in the corner, Ted could be behind the board right there, and they could sort of s- signal the drummer, the vocal booth, right? And, yeah. and be Everybody able- Everybody was in communication. Everybody was in communication. He, he talked about how this, he said he loved, so he, you know, he's, I, think, I think for his purposes, Sunset had that um, flexibility for him. And so um, whether it was like, oh, we want to get this sort of interesting sound, let's do stuff in, some, in one or in two. Um, but they did, a, I mean, they did a lot of stuff a lot of stuff at Amigo um, because that was, you know, that was, I, I don't know exactly how the billing went for that, but I assume when Warner Brothers owned oh, the studio. Oh, I'm sure it was a little more flexible. <laughs> right, sure. You know, I mean. A little employee, employee it was, discount. It was a company-owned studio. Right, right. So, you know, if you had a big budget, you could probably afford to come here. But, I mean, I was um, quite taken back on 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 the book and, and how complimentary he was about Sunset Sound. It was just, I mean, oh, yeah. it brought tears to my eyes. Oh, it's I great. Mean, he, I mean, he compared us to uh, West Coast Abbey Road. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was just shocking. I mean, I know he did a lot of product in here, but he was so. Uh, I don't know. He was so excited. To t- I talked to him briefly, and then got you guys on the phone the other day. But he was just thrilled to even speak with you. We got to get him in here soon. I mean, the fans just every YouTube comment is, "Where's Ted?" <laughs> like, Where's Ted? We're trying to get him in, guys. We're here with his author. He's yeah. an international man of mystery. What can I tell you? He's yeah. like, yeah, he's like, who knows? He's like, maybe he's on a he's on a, the Learjet flying to Bermuda or something. I don't know where he is, but he's a uh, yeah. He he's always spoke so highly of this place, and I think you know, I think part of it was that um, I, he always felt that the artists loved it here too. I mean, that was going back to the Carly Simon Big record. I, I, it's kind of. Um, an album that maybe doesn't get talked about enough because it didn't sell a ton of records, but that was done in 75 and 76, and that was called Another Passenger. And so um, this would have been after she did all those great records with Richard Perry, and then Ted gets a chance to do an album with her, and say, Glenn Fry, James Taylor, Linda Ronstadt, Dr. John, Van Dyke Parks, um, I, a whole a host of other people come through. He said it was like, you know, it was like, a, he said it was just, you know, a constant stream of, of uh, Basically, you know, celebrity musicians coming to play on this record. They were so excited to play on this record. But, you know, he talked about how kind of that doing it at Sunset made it more exciting and gave it more of a buzz than like, oh, we're doing it at Amigo. I don't know. And part of it because the way the room sounded. But I think also there was a there was a, you know, a certain 
um, energy, in energy, there. and there's something special about it. I mean, that's the thing. You know, it's the it's goes back to the the '60s stuff with the doors and Zeppelin. Yeah, I mean, it was an incredible hotbed around here. Right. People flowing through the doors. Right. It, I mean, still quite is. Quite honestly, it was still is. But I mean, it just was a rotational thing of so many people coming here every day. Yep. Yeah. Jeff Jample, the Doors manager, I just interviewed him. Interviews up now, and he was talking about. He's like, this place is more than just a room with yeah, outboard gear. Exactly. This is like a mecca. There's a, a, an energy in here. Right. There's and there really is. I mean, right. this is why I say this to Paul all the time. I mean, every time I pull up, I'm listening to your audiobook this morning while the gates opening at Sunset Sound, and now cool. we're in here and man in Studio Two just talking awesome. about it. It's just you're never in a bad mood here. It's such an, an amazing place. And you know what I think also. I was talking. I was telling you, Brad Wilkin uh, from Rage. We might do something Van Halen oriented, and he goes for Sunset Sound. Anything. I mean, people just—he's one of the biggest rock drummers in the world. He doesn't need to do anything. But, and for Ted to mention, he could have just said the studio, but oh, he no. makes sure to say Sunset oh, no. Sound. He probably says Sunset Sound 150 yeah. times in the book. Absolutely, that's uh, awesome. Yeah, yeah he. Uh, you know, again, it was it was. Uh, I think having come in here with Lee Hirschberg. And Lenny Wonker, who was probably, I mean, I think Lenny was probably like only a couple years older than Ted. He was like 24, 25. He's a young, young producer um, to have Leon. And um, I, if I'm remembering correctly from the book, he, you know, they, they, whatever, they put the piano through the echo chamber. I don't know what exactly what did. He said like, I could hear like there was something that stuck in Ted's head about those first sessions that he did there with the Wrecking Crew. And, you know, all, all that Ted did was sing. All they did was he and um, the couple of other guys in the band sang. It was the Wrecking Crew did all the instrumental stuff. But he said it was just uh -huh. something something special about that and uh i don't think he ever he ever forgot that and again he worked in other places in town we've talked about later he worked in other places in town but it was always it was always for him a first a first choice i mean to work if it was possible to work in sunset sound i think also a lot of musicians and producers the privacy that you have in here there's no pictures paul's father early on implemented that that they're in there working, don't touch them, don't mess with them, don't even open the door. Yeah. And you can kind of, you know, it's Paul and his father, the only owners of this place. The, no, and, yeah. Nobody else ever. So it's like, it's just a fun place to be. There's kind of not rules, but you can kind of just do what you want. You get the work done. It's <laughs> What happens to Sunset Sound stays. It's <laughs> just, sunset, it's except for the songs. Yeah. The songs can come out, but everything yeah. else stays in there. Um, that uh, There was this little story I was going to tell you guys that, uh, so um, I asked... Don Landy something about the Fair Warning record and uh, he was talking about the basketball court and he said you know the cowbell on hear about it later I said yeah he said we recorded that cowbell out there in the brick courtyard wow. oh, they did. yeah he That's said they so awesome. they said that the uh, whatever they had recorded the cowbell in the room with Alex I think I, I don't know which studio they did it and he said we wanted to see if we could make it um, whatever sound louder and he said yeah we, we set up and they recorded the cowbell outside at the yeah so I don't know how often that was, that space has I ever been used as idea. a. I didn't know that. But yeah, did That's they record cool. the cars revving up here too? There's this. Uh, no, that was done up at that was done up at Eddie's for house. For Panama, oh, that was yeah, that was that was okay. the, that was the last um, album before Dave left. And that was done up at up at uh, Ed's house. But yeah, the, the cow. I wanted to make sure to, to drop the cowbell yeah. knowledge on you guys. Like you can't forget about the cowbell. But yet, um, I don't know the exact where exactly where it was. But he said that yeah, we did the had the you know reverberated off the bricks and it sounded really really great. I know they did the car, Eddie's 1971 Ferrari, uh, up at 5150 for Panama. But mm -hmm. didn't we hear that they ran something through to your parking spot and Eddie's car was there? His Volvo or something? <laughs> well, that's what I was bringing that up. Yeah, I, I remember I, someone I telling remember us that. I something about that, but I can't remember what. So uh, they had the... Uh, my recollection, maybe if this, is, if this is what you're referring to, is the, is the car horns for, for on Running with the Devil. Yeah, that. Right, they had a they had a noisemaker that they used to use at concerts. They had basically gotten a, a car battery, and they had gotten someone to, to basically wire car horns in a series with a foot pedal. So you would step on the foot pedal, and it would go pam pam. It was a noisemaker, and that's they they I don't know where they recorded that. But that was okay. That's what I think I'm thinking of. So it's when the horns, they're running with the devil when they slowed down the yeah. slowed down the horns. I don't know where exactly that was. Um, of course, the other thing that that you maybe can confirm the story that Ted remembered, that when they went on the road, I think Roth abandoned his car here. Like basically, yeah. like he left his. Well, like, I read that in your book. Oh, <laughs> but 
I don't. I don't <laughs> it's too that. good to check, right? Yeah. Could, um, you know, maybe it wasn't here, but Ted said you remember that, like, he's just like, you know, just beat up you know like, or well, just yeah. whatever, like, it just didn't start. He just left it there, and like, you know, like Ted shows up for some other session. He's like, yeah, he's on the road, right? He's gone. He's gone doing his thing. But yeah, the car horns. Um, I should ask ask those guys where that was, where they actually mic'd that up and did that. But yeah, that was something else too that is worth remarking. That Gene, um, they put that on the Gene Simmons demo. That it wasn't. Well, exactly the same, but it was a similar type of thing. Mm. So let's speak of the man of mystery known as Don Landy. The fans want to know. I want to touch down on this. And, you know, what a a road for you, though, from being in your high school mm -hmm. listening to Jump. Yep. And now you're going into the Van Halen vault with Don Landy and Ted Templeman. Can yeah. you touch down on that real quick? So you're researching. Sure. It wasn't just the Van Halen vault. So um, <laughs> I want to make sure no one thinks I went to 5150 to, uh, on an on, on authorized entry. Um, so, yeah, what I was lucky enough um, when I was finishing up the TED book, I needed to go to the Warner Brothers uh, tape library, which is uh, in Hollywood, to um, finalize some, foot, I had some requests for photographs and went up and was able to look at some stuff. And... Um, Don came along, Don, you know, Don and I went up there together. Um, I'd never met Don in person before and, uh, it was incredible. I mean, it was really amazing. They brought out, um, some old tape boxes from Little Feet and one of the guys in Little Feet, I don't remember which, unfortunately, I can't remember which guy it was, which of the gentleman might've been, um, Billy Payne, maybe not, was an artist and a lot of the tape boxes had these sketches on them. Now, at the time they were like, well, who did the drawings? And, and Don knew, he's like, oh. One of the guys in Little Feet was an artist, and so the tape box would have like you know hands, like kind of like cartoons, like '70s era cartoons right. on the tape boxes, and so they just you know they kind of they brought Don out some stuff, and it was it was incredible. Yeah, it was an incredible experience. I mean, honestly, it was. Um, and they had our Sunset Sound labels on some of them. I don't remember. I don't remember that. I mean, I um, they basically the archivist brought them out on the table, and like we kind of like you know let, let Don look at them. I, I I tried to keep my grubby hands off the stuff and just sort of observe. But um, I presume, yeah, um, certainly like we talked about um, the uh, Time Loves a Hero album was done here in this room. A lot of the stuff and um, the first Little Feet record I think was done. Um, some of it was done here. Um, the second was Cold Cold Cold. But um, yeah, that was that was great. So there wasn't just when we went up there. Um, and again, that was the first time I had met Don in person. It wasn't just, you know, to see Van Halen stuff. It was a whole host of stuff. They basically, you know, they were super excited to have Don up there. And um, they obviously know the history of how many albums he did for Warner Brothers. And they were tons and tons and tons of stuff and was able to kind of show him some stuff. So he was, he was, um, I think he enjoyed it. And he, I think he enjoyed it. They, you know, kind of knowing that up there they have basically a copy of every single album that Warner Brothers ever, ever made. Like, That's you know, it's like, yeah, like, you know, wow. it's amazing. Where is it? The valley, is it the Beacon storage place? That high concrete building. I, I, it's I think, in Hollywood. I don't know the. I think that's where it's at. It's okay. it's a um, like a vault. It's that. It's not over the hill though. It's here. No, it's that cold. You know what they call it? Iron Mountain. Ah, uh, okay, 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 okay. So, you know, Ted's so complimentary of Don. He was given Don a point on his albums, out of his producer's deal. Don is such an integral part of the sound. Did you really dive into the technicalities of kind of the miking and all? Did you research that stuff or? I mean, the best I could. I mean, I think my, my understanding of it is like primitive and I think Don and Ted were very, very patient with me as I tried to understand. Um, you know, I, I, didn't, um, I didn't go too deep into that stuff with those guys, but you know, when you would talk to, to uh, Ted or Don, for example, about the Eddie Van Halen guitar sound, and they would basically go, whatever, you might EQ this or do this to it, but he's like, it was the way he sounded in the room. Like, wasn't like, you know, Don especially is like, it's, you know, this whole idea that there's sort of this studio sound. It's like, it's, it's partially, original. partially, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's true that the studio makes a difference, but it's, it's the hands of the player, right? So like, I was, ca I was able to accurately capture what was coming out of the speaker because we were in a great facility and had great equipment. Um, you know, the other things that um, Don and Ted did talk about was um you know for example the um the way that you could you could really um move the baffles around in this room and that's nothing you know particularly unique or anything like that but basically this room like it's sort of experiment went with things and um but they also had a you know i would say too about the the way they would mic things they had a i think a pretty good blueprint on what 
they wanted to do because they'd done so many records before. It was sort of like, you know, I don't think, I don't think Ted had to ever say anything to Don about, oh, I want this mic this way. Maybe if they were like playing with something to get a different sound, but it was like, I think at that point it was like, they almost had like Ted and Don almost had a pilot co-pilot thing. They talked about that quite a bit that like basically. Yeah, Don knew the room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Eddie and Don would work late at night and, and in your book and Ted's book, he says that's complete bullshit where they would sneak away and do solos at night and overdubs. He goes, I always knew when they were recording. The well, album. I mean, I think, I think Ted's point was in saying that is that he will read things on the internet that there was this sort of, um, you know, this omerta like sneaking around behind Ted's back to record things. And Ted always said that, why would I not want Don and Ted to work together? He's like, I don't, he said, always said, I don't give a shit if they were there or not. I would listen to what they did the next day. That's fine. But he said, he's always said that almost always, I, you know, if we were lock, locked, you know, a lockout, we're in the room. He's like, I, I didn't go. He said, I would go to dinner sometimes. And um, he also said, I think that's um, interesting to observe too. He said, you know, some, you know, he said, for whatever reason, even if you know somebody super well, you're on your third or fourth album, you're doing fair warning. Um, you know, you just kind of got the felt, but maybe I'm making him nervous or something like that. He's pressing too much because I'm in the room and I'm the producer. So he'd just be like, I'm leaving. Yeah. I'm just going to go and I'll come back. Um, you know, I think, you know, maybe that's what Eddie was getting at when he was talking and you know, kind of referring to that was basically that he and Don did a lot of stuff um, by themselves. But I think in some ways, I mean, I think that's, a comp I mean, in a lot of ways, it's a compliment to what Ted thought of Don as, a, as an engineer slash, you know, assistant producer. He wasn't called that, but I think that's what Ted would always say he was. And also about, um, you know, his, his faith in Eddie that, like, I just need to, you know, the guy's good. Like, you know, just like, you know, Ted also would talk about how, you know, one of the most important lessons a producer has to learn is the one to shut the fuck up. He's like, you know, sometimes you'd be in a session with a producer and I'd be watching when he was a younger musician and they'd be just talking and talking and talking and making the person so nervous. Sometimes you're just like, oh, they're talking to the engineer. He would say that happened with Ronnie Montrose a lot. Like something would be going on and Don would be out here talking to Ronnie and he just said, I wouldn't, I'd just sit there and wait till Don came back and said, what's going on? And I said, okay. And just, you know, because yeah. it's like you're like the, you can actually be um, demoralizing to the, the uh, morale of the artist if you're too, you know, you just have to sort of, that's what he said, you just have to sort of know it's like a psychological project as much as it is a technical project. Sometimes you just have to, you know, people have, I mean, that's the other thing I think I, I really learned from Ted. You know, he'd talk about like, oh, you know, Michael McDonald will get nervous or something. I'm like, what? What do you mean Michael McDonald will get nervous? He's like, you don't, you don't understand, do you? I was like, no, I guess I don't. He's like, even like super talented people have doubts. You know, he said, you know, just not just Michael, it was like a whole host of people like, you know, uh, Sure. Um, Carly Simon would get nervous and like she would start pressing and you just sort of like, oh, you know, they're like the greatest, one of the greatest singers in the world. How could they be nervous? And just like, you know, it's, it's just because you have super, super talent doesn't mean you have superhuman confidence that you can just sort of like fight your way through any sort of situation. So I think a lot of that stuff, you know, maybe if Eddie was here, he would tell it differently. And maybe if Dom was sitting here, he might tell it differently from what, you know, I gathered from that was that Ted a lot of times just knew that those guys were working. It wasn't as if it was some sort of big conspiracy theory. He just wanted the stuff, the work to get done and trusted Don and trusted Ed. Even if they, go ahead, Paul. Well, he said, you know, he, what he also said to me when I was talking to him, he said, uh, you know, I know there's rumors going around that, that, you know, they would work late at night and I wouldn't be involved and they'd sneak stuff. He goes, that's not the case. He goes, I had 9 a.m. meetings at right. like Warner Brothers. She goes, I'm not going to stay in the studio until 2 a.m. Right. They, they know what they're doing. I'm do, right. They're doing a guitar solo or something. He goes, I'm going to hear it the next day. I'm going to confer with Don, and Don's going to, you know, we're going to talk about what we did. And he goes, I, and sometimes I had uh, meetings at night. Right. I had to leave. Right. Or I went home to see my family. Right. He goes, that's another thing. So. Right. Yeah, I mean, I th and, and that's part of the, the, you know, kind of the supreme confidence of, that Ted had in, in Don. I mean, that was the thing. That's why it was such a great partnership. It was, you know, like the co-pilot, like, you know, right. the, the pilots, pilots falling asleep and the co-pilot can still land the plane, you know? That's right. Yeah, even if they did, who cares? If they did sneak off, you know, they yeah, make great think, music. Because you know, Peggy and uh, the great Doug Messenger both said, did, yeah, that's a good question. Did um, Ted ever mention about the Unchained kind of battle, uh, you know, the urban legend that went down in this room? You know, or Ted stormed off, and I mean, Doug I was in here, and I listen. I I have no reason to think that that's not um, 
could have happened. I don't know. Don uh, and Ted never mentioned that to me. I mean, I think anybody who's been involved in any sort of creative project will realize there's going to be moments where people lose their temper and like walk off. Um, but yeah, I never heard that from from Ted that I stormed out of the room. But I mean, I think you would be uh, hard pressed to imagine any band situation where the people aren't going to get pissed during the making of a record. I mean, you know, so yeah, I mean, like a loser, it. like loser. You know, lose your temper. So, um, but you know, I think I think really Ted's overall um, mindset when we talked about it was just how much fun he's always. It was just so much fun. He goes, "Yeah, I mean, obviously there were things that weren't as much fun as some other things. I mean, obviously, but um, but he always just talked about how much fun he had with those guys. He said it was just always at the beginning. You know, and as time went on, and I think as Eddie and Alex particularly had different ideas about um, the way they wanted to approach. The making of the records and there was that a parting um that was a painful thing for ted and i think you know a painful a painful thing i'm sure for a lot of ways for don too but um you know especially he said in the early records especially he said it was just you know we would they would come back to town after being on the road for 10 months and they'd be tired but they'd be excited and they had these songs he said it was like it was awesome you know it was like you know he's like they were so creative and they would always come up with this um you know even songs like everybody wants somewhere there were no lyrics for dave would come up with this i mean that's what you're talking about like um having Dave sing in the vocal booth and sort of doing all of this X-rated vocals. And they're like, you know, T Ted and Don are like dying laughing, knowing they can't actually ever use any of these vocals, but the band is playing and there's this great vibe. And, you know, he said that was what was fun about Van Halen. So, you know, um, I think I think for whatever Doug might have witnessed or whoever might have witnessed in terms of bad moments, I just don't think, I mean, I don't think Ted's trying to sanitize anything. I just don't think it's like stuck in his mind where he's like, you know, there, there were certainly things he remembered about, um, you know, other things later when the band was breaking up and there was hard moments. But in the early records, he doesn't, you know, he never was like, oh, it sucked. It was terrible. It was just, you know, it was like, great. I mean, you know, you're you're working with Van Halen and such that sound and you're you're making platinum records and kind of consistently. It's a pretty, I think it's pretty hard to be in a bad mood with that. What did Don say about uh, the time with Van Halen? Obviously, we know what Ted said through your book and what you just mentioned right there. But did Don say anything significant when you spent, uh, you know, we've... Uh, about working with Van Halen? Yeah. I mean, I, I think he worked with so many artists. Did you I mean, say I think a story he, that you know, you know, it, it, whenever out. I talk to Don about Van Halen or the end of the artist, I mean, I think he he talks about just how talented they are. I mean, I think that's the thing that um, it, it might be easy for everyone to kind of understand if you think about someone like Don who doesn't really like to do interviews and doesn't want to be in the public eye. I mean, he like really gives all the credit to the artist. He's like, oh yeah. And we all know that that's not, you know, you know better than I do and you know how much a good engineer makes a difference in how a record sounds. But you know, um, I think I think Don has great appreciation for the fact that he worked for everyone from the Everly Brothers, to Neil Young, to Eddie Van Halen, to Ronnie Montrose, to Lowell George, to Michael McDonald, to Tom Johnson, to Pat Simmons, to Van Carly Morrison. Simon, Van Morrison. I think, you know, um, you know, I don't think Don is a guy who's going to sit there and read his own press clippings, but I think on the other hand, I think he has a tremendous appreciation that he went from being a kid, I think grew up in Santa Monica, I hope that's right, um, you know, wanting to make records to basically um, coming up here and I think he told me applying for a job and being sent away because he was inexperienced and he you know as a young kid and then ends up at TTG as we talked about then Sun West and then finally gets to make a you know make music here with with um, Ted who he had met during the Harper's Bazaar thing so I think I mean I think for for Don it's the whole I think he's very proud of his discography I mean he did some incredible stuff a lot of albums that people like um you know people that stuff like uh but we mentioned, um, you know, he worked on the first, the uh, uh, one of the first door sessions, maybe outside of uh, Sunset Sound, which was done at TTG. Yeah. Waiting for the sun. It's waiting for the sun. Yeah. You know, um, uh, Gordon Lightfoot. Oh wow. Uh, Neil Young. Now, I just actually, um, Don just told me a great. You mentioned Neil Young had been in here recently, right? Yep. He told me I'll tell you a great, a great Neil Young story that Don just told me. And I, you know, occasionally I'll look through discogs and I'll write him a note and say, oh, I didn't realize you worked on this. He goes, oh, yeah. So I think it was, I think it was with Lenny. I could be wrong. They worked on um, the first or second Neil Young record. And um, Don was working at SunWest Studios at the time. And I don't know if Don was locking up. He was like, you said, the last one to leave. And there was like a knock at the door. And it was, you know, it was the door of the studio. And it was 
Neil Young, and it was Neil said, "Hey, hey, Don, is your last name spelled your first name spl uh, spelled with two N's or one?" And he said, two. He goes, that's what I thought. They're going to get it wrong in the liner notes. Okay, I'm going to go fix that. And he said that, as he's like, he's a gem. He was like, like how many artists would bother like going to find the second engineer or whatever, yeah. or the, you know, the engineer to go and like make sure. He's like, I think, I thought, I knew they were misspelling your name. I'm going to make sure that's right. And made it, and it's right on that, you know, because a lot of times it will say like Don Landy or, right. you know, with one end. But he said like, Neil actually he showed got up. got it right. He made it, got it right. So wow. it was, you know, I think he's, um, you know, I think he's very aware that, you know, in the, in the whatever, the 20 plus years he did it, he, he really worked with, you know, that's pretty much the peak, the pinnacle. What, what are you going to work with that's better? Your book was responsible for kind of reconnecting them. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's kind of kind of quirky about that was that um, that I was able to, I reached Don separately than I reached Ted. And, uh, you know, and working on the Van Halen Rising book, I talked to Don once and I talked to Ted once. And then when I went to do the, um, you know, I worked working the, on the um, Templeman biography book, I would do a little bit more back and forth. And I'd be like, oh, you know, I'd email Ted. I'd say, oh, I just spoke to, you know, I just talked to Don. Oh, how's he doing? Oh, good, good. You know, and there was, there was just, I think, you know, it was one of those things where I think they hadn't um, talked as much and they, you know, they email more now, but I sort of like, you know, not by design, but sort of forcibly, <laughs> kind of like, you know, because actually Don was, uh, you know, um, everyone should know, I mean, beyond the photographs, Don was absolutely instrumental in making of the Ted Templeman book, you know, classic engineer, like doesn't really want any credit, but was, was super helpful, like with a lot of things, like he has, you know, um, some tape boxes and just some, some paperwork and just sort of has a good memory of things and we could sort of um, fill out some holes. And like, I'd be like, you know, Don, who was this, who else worked on this record? And he'd be like, oh, I don't remember a name. And I'd go back to Ted and he goes, that's right, Don remembers, you know, Don, um, was able to really fill out some stuff. So yeah, they were That's able right. to kind of reconnect in that sort of way. But um, That's fine. yeah, they are. Uh, well, Mr. Landy or Mr. Templeman, we don't even have to have cameras going. We could have a nice cup of tea for you. We'll <laughs> sit here, just have the microphones and discuss. And the door's always open. <laughs> 60th an year anniversary this year. We didn't get to celebrate it last year so uh, for, since COVID, but we're trying to go through all this stuff and document what we can. Um, <laughs> you, like, Greg is laughing. It's, like, it's just it's a it's the rolling out the red carpet. I mean, yeah, it's like, yep. It's just to be honest, it drives me nuts that Mr. Templeman's right down the street, and we're in here talking about him, and I think he wants to be here. I can I can feel it. <laughs> Let's kick it back to Eddie. Seventy five, seventy six. His guitar playing is just going to new levels. And we were talking earlier, if Van Halen 1 was made in 1975, it'd be a completely different album. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? What's, what's Eddie doing in 1975 and 76? Yeah, I mean, I think, I, you know, I can't take um, full credit for this. I talked to a guitar player uh, who was around on the scene at that time who kind of really, I asked this similar type of question. He was like, don't you, you get it? And I said, well, no, I don't think I guess I do. He's like, all of the things that Eddie sort of became most known for the two-handed tapping, the really crazy tremolo bar stuff, the uh, super overdriven guitar sound. Like Eddie was kind of toying with all those things in 75, 76. He had those pieces of things, but it all sort of um, kind of came together for him as a guitar player in 77. And I, I you know, the analogy I would use is almost like a, if anyone's a, a fan of uh, the NFL or the NBA draft, they'll talk about has a player peaked yet? Like, in other words, is someone going to be like, you know, yeah. like the, um, I live in Oklahoma now, so the classic example is kind of um, Brian Bosworth, who was like an incredible dominant college football player, and he never really converted into the pros to be that same type of dominant player. Like, when is the person going to peak? You know, and Eddie hit that peak and then stayed on that, you know, that stayed on that level for that years following it. But yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing to think about if they had been signed. I mean, I think you can hear it on the Gene Simmons demo. It's a different, he's not doing any of the two-handed tapping, which sort of became his his trademark. And it's just, it's, it's um, there's not any of the whammy bar stuff and really his whole, you know, the way he's attacking the um, the strings even, it's not quite as aggressive as he did on the, on the next year. So it's just for, you know, just a, a kind of, I think a happenstance and good fortune that whenever Ted kind of got onto them, that was sort of when they were, um, ascending and that at that uh, to that peak that that Eddie really yeah I mean we can kind of hear that that snapshot on um, that moment in time with Van Halen one where it's just it's just you know everyone was like everybody was like jaw drops yeah 
life has its own you have to be patient you know it just kind of runs its own course and it's just things it's like why how uh van halen wasn't signed until a certain point you know it's just and that's also went along with eddie's guitar playing yeah and i think the thing about with you know they with work the, themselves out the sign yeah the signing thing i mean i think i think you also had someone with ted templeman who had a had a big string of hits with the doobie brothers and had really was on the rise and had the you know, um, had the uh, the cred inside the company to be able to go to Mo Austin and be like, we should sign these guys. And, I, you know, Mo, Mo apparently liked them. Mo, Ted always talked about how Mo was into Hendrix and the Kinks and kind of liked harder rock. That was kind of like if Mo, like the Who, if Mo liked anything, that's what he liked more than the soft rock stuff. Um, but, you know, I think whatever they saw that night at the Starwood, I'm not sure that Mo Austin was as sold maybe, again, I don't know for sure, but Ted was sold. And, you know, kind of Ted had the credibility to go to Mo Austin and say, you should sign these guys. And, uh, okay, you know, yeah. it, that mattered. I mean, that really did, <laughs> you know, it's... it's. Uh, he made the right call. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I think, and uh, you could just imagine the, unfor- the Starwood, I think, well, I shouldn't say fortunately, maybe, uh, unfortunately, I say maybe fortunately it's been bulldozed and it's gone. But, um, you know, you can only imagine what it was like when those guys, when the, Mo Austin and Ted Templeman walk into the back of the Starwood and it was like, hey, you know, we're going to sign you guys and just, you know. So, a question about your book, 1978 is when you chose for Van Halen Rising to end. What was the thought process behind that? Well, I'm laughing because, like, uh, yeah, um, I get that question sometimes from people, and I was like, well, if I, you, know, you should have told the whole story. I was like, well, it's 300. Yeah, I, I think it's like, cool. Like, like, you know, like, unusual, yeah, but like, awesome. like the Moby Dick length of Van Halen. I'm not sure anyone would be able to live through that. <laughs> Moby Dick. Yeah. yeah um, <laughs> no, I mean, I think. You know, one of the things I learned in, in graduate school, I had a really good mentor. Her name was uh, Jackie Jones, and she's a professor. And, uh, you know, she talked about sometimes when you write a book or you're telling a story, you know, you have to think about um, where to end it. It may not always end in, like, the um, basically the chronological end to it doesn't have to necessarily be that spot that everyone thinks it should be. Like, in other words, why didn't you take the book up to 1984? But you know, the other thing was that, for me, that was sort of the culmination of what those guys had worked. Anyway, it sort of seemed like the natural end of the book because they had worked so hard to get the record deal, and then they go out and they're able to sell two million copies of an album that really, even Ted was like, you know, I didn't know what it was going to do. He said, I didn't think it was going to sell two million copies. I thought it was a good band, and I thought we would have a good foothold. Like you said, like, you go to the second record. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't like Ted was like, well, it's definitely going to sell, you know, it's definitely going to sell 10 million copies but by, you know, by 20 years later. Um, you just hope for a you know a good start for something to build off of it, and so to have that be the the close of the book. I mean, for me, that's the triumph of what was the first whatever the first chapter in the Van Halen saga was this get the deal ending, you know, being the, the kind of the wrap up, and then them going on the road and coming back and being you know being stars. I mean, to go from being I thought that was so cool. You go from basically being completely anonymous outside of California. I mean, really anonymous. Yeah. You fly across the country. Chicago, it's like 20 below zero. You're playing for 30 minutes uh, at 7.30 at night with no one in the room to the end of the tour where you're playing stadiums and upstaging bands like Black Sabbath in Boston. And, and uh, that's, you know. It's a great success story. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that's, that's they're at their pinnacle starting. That was good. A few more questions. 5150, um, for those who have been living on the moon, was Eddie Van Halen's studio in his backyard, his home studio. Ted has said that it was very uncomfortable in there. It was smaller, and the room didn't sound good, um, numerous other things. Is that correct? Well, I don't know if he ever said the room didn't sound good. I think he said it sounded different than what he liked. I think that he, he was always very clear with me that it was a matter of taste. He said that you know what Eddie and Alex and Don were getting out of 5150 – was you know uh, was something that was sonically unique but he said you know you couldn't there was no ability to generate a room sound up there and that was one thing that really was difficult for ted he said that's why like sunset you get you could get a good room sound he also talked about in terms of the comfort level when 5150 again this is ted's take on it when 5150 was being built initially it was supposed to be a demo studio and what i mean by that was Mm -hmm. that it was supposed to be a place where instead of having to use a little four-track tape on a coffee table in Eddie's bedroom or something, or his, you know, he'd actually have a room where they could actually have a little um, 
ability to record, like a little tiny drum set or whatever, and just to be able to record. It said that after Don, who, with Howard Weiss, built the studio up there, and it sounded so incredible that that's when those guys approached Ted and said, we should try to do a record up here. And at the time, Ted said, it was really unfinished. So you look around this room, it's a, it's a built-out finished studio. There were exposed two by fours. There were things that were like wires on the floor. He said that the patch bays, the only one who could actually decipher the patch bays Don. was Don, that Don had it all memorized. And so he said like, I don't know, like I don't know about this. But he said, you know, those guys were really excited about what they were getting. And he said, he said, look, he said, it's a matter of taste. He's like, but it wasn't what I liked sonically. He didn't think, I don't think he meant it, he would say it sounded bad. It just was different. He said, I liked the sound of Sunset. And the other thing he said that was, I think, relevant here, a couple of things is number one, you know, um, you know, we look at the control room, right? It's, I'd never been in here before, but it's much bigger than I actually expected. But he, he would talked about how, because 5150 was a relatively small space, he said it was very confined and just very claustrophobic. So he said that for him, that was a tough thing. He also said that when he works at Sunset or he worked at Amigo, correct me if I'm wrong, Don was always on his... Right. Left. On his left. Yeah. And it's on the right, on the producer's table, on the end, on the right. And, and Don's it, working the board from the middle to the left. And at 5150, yeah. it was flipped. Yeah. But, you know, Ted was always... I think it just kind of goes to the nature of the friendship between Ted and Don. I mean, Ted was always very clear that he's like, what Don did was incredible. He's like, basically, he took like, you know, like a room and turned it into this like world-class, incredibly 1980s sounding room that was sort of, a, a, took things to a whole different level in terms of sonics. So he was always very careful to say that even though it wasn't what I would have preferred, you know, it just kind of, to have Don have built that thing by hand, he's like, you know, Don said, but Ted said to me, you know, Don was like a pilot who could build the 747 by parts. You'd like, you know, leave the guy alone in a warehouse, you know, for two months and you come back and the 747 would be together. He said, that's the, t and then he could fly the plane. That's what he said. So he said, um, you know, for him, there was that. He also, I think, wanted to um, try to exercise some caution with those guys to be like, look, I'd been to home studios before. He had been, for example, to Brian's, Brian Wilson's house and sort of seen what can happen when there's no meter running, so to speak, and there's not a lot of... Um, no structure. No, just an ability to sort of say, it's got to be done by this time. And Ted was really always the guy who was able to deliver these records on time. Um, he was an executive of the company and was responsible for these budgets. And so he also, you know, I think regardless of what... Uh, whatever anyone would say about, oh, well, he's with the record company. What does he care what the band gets charged? I mean, Ted always had been an artist himself and wanted to make sure that, you know, you weren't getting billed for ridiculous ridiculous stuff because this stuff all sort of goes on the band's debt. So he he had misgivings about working at 5150, but he said, I wanted to give it a try because I respected what... Those guys were so excited about it, and I knew that, like, Don particularly had poured his heart and soul into building this thing. You know, and that he said, we just... That was why, but... Yes, he wanted to do the album at Sunset. He was kind of like, I, you know, he, he couldn't quite understand why, but um, they would want to do that. But he went ahead with it. The other thing that Ted has said to me numerous times, he said, you know, as much as I think that we ran into a lot of problems up there, I think if you read the book, you can kind of see what those problems were. He said, the other thing I recognize is that one of the reasons why Jump came out so great was that there was no meter running. And that those guys had the time, right? They started really working on the album in, I don't know, something like March, excuse me, like April or May of 1983. And they worked on Jump for a long time. He said, but that would be like, you know, part of the, the reason that happened was that Don was able to be behind that little board up there going, it's great, keep going, keep going. And I wasn't, you know, he, Ted wasn't up there. This was just Don and Ed just sort of like playing the stuff. And he said, I'm not sure. And I, I think, you know, it's to credit to Ted to saying that. He's like, I'm not sure if we worked at Sunset that Jump would have come out as, as incredible because we might have finished it. I might have said, okay, this is it. We're done with the song before it fully evolved into the sort of classic that it was with all the different parts and, the you know, the, the little um, things that Ed and Don did with it and Alex. So, um, you know, I think that's the, 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 the basic crux of it was that Ted had misgivings about not working at Sunset with the lack of structure, had some misgivings about the Sonics, only because he said, like he said, it's like chocolate versus vanilla. I just preferred chocolate, and those guys like this vanilla. Um, 
and uh, yeah, kind of um, breaking with what had been kind of a consistent pattern. The only reason why with Diver Down, they worked at Amigo for part of it, I think was because it had to be done on such short notice, they couldn't get in here. They did some of the stuff here. They did some of it. Right, they couldn't do it all here only because they couldn't get in, right? That's what I think that Don and Ted both told me, that they were just, it had to be done in such a rush that they, they couldn't book the room. Yeah, that's what the, uh, why it was, right? I think so, yeah. Do you personally think Personally, and I know you've written the book on Ted, and I think you know what I'm going to ask, that he built 5150 to just kind of ease his Of course he's not going to say, Eddie is going to say, I'm trying to escape Ted, I want to be on my own. Because he wanted, at the same time, he wanted to start producing. And that brings us to Alan Holdsworth, which, you know, he brought that to Ted. Do you think he was trying to go out on his own and he could produce himself? He had Don Landy up there with him. Uh, you know, they started running out the back door with the tapes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think, you know, I don't think, I'll tell you only you think you he just Ted. wanted to practice house it is you know just no I mean briefly. I think I think I think what I learned from talking to Ted was that Ted recognized that Ed was growing as an artist and he's like this is part of was Ed's interest in trying to um, do more stuff as a musician whether it be the keyboards or working on the production of records I think the example that Ted always pointed to in talking about this was that there was a, a band meeting up at 5150 right after they had sort of opened the facility. And so the four guys were up there and and Ted came up and they were, I think they were probably meeting to figure out when they were going to start work or whatever. They were up there talking. And uh, Dave said, according to Ted, hey, Ted, would you excuse us for a minute? And they, he said, sure. And they all walked into the into 5150 and closed the door. And Ted said, I didn't think anything of it. I just was whatever I was doing. I was standing outside and or sitting on the bench and just, you know, waiting. And uh, he said that eventually Ed came out and he was like upset. He said, what's wrong? He's like, I can't believe he'd said that to you. Um, what are you talking about? And Ed said, what are you talking about? He's like, oh, the way he should have invited you. And I can't believe he said that to you. Like, he, you know, basically the implication was that that Eddie felt angry that Dave had, you know, I don't think, I don't know that Roth meant anything by it, but basically that he was trying to shut Eddie, felt that, Eddie was afraid that Ted was thinking, oh, they're already trying to shut me out of this place. But, you know, he said that wasn't like what it was like at all. I just think, you know, um, there was a difference of opinion, especially about the keyboard material, right, that started to be, you know, I think for... It's too poppy. It should be more yeah, raunchy. I mean, I think, I think, yeah, I think that's right. And I think that one of the things that, that ended up happening was that there probably was some miscommunication about things that got really um, built into resentments, I think. I think, you know, t Ted tried to be careful when he did the book with me to say that I thought Jump was a great song. I just didn't think it fit. I was afraid it wasn't going to fit with Van Halen. I just thought it was going to be something that people weren't going to accept for Van Halen. He's like, I didn't think, you know, it wasn't as I thought that, wow, this isn't cool. He actually thought when it was finished, he's like, this is amazing. But he's like, oh my gosh, if people hear this, and they think, what happened to Van Halen, right? That's what he was, you know, he was thinking as a producer, um, you know. And so I think, I think that was part and parcel. You know, and again, a lot of other, other issues that I think if you read the book, you can kind of pick up on that probably didn't, didn't help things. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, Ted is, I think, an optimistic outlook on it. I mean, the one thing he always likes to joke about is that he said at some point that he and Eddie were having a disagreement about jump or, you know, he says, like, it sounds like something It's going to be, you know, sounds like an organ in a, a basketball stadium or something or a, a baseball. It sounds like the organ in a baseball game, you know, and whatever Eddie said. And they were sort of going back and forth about this, de debating it. And uh, <laughs> Ted said, he goes, well, I was right. He goes, now when you go to a baseball game, you pretty much can't ever go to a sporting event and not hear the song Jump played over the PA system. You know, he's like, so I was right. You know, of course, you know, but that's the type of stuff like, you know, that I think. I think probably led to some, some, you know, a lot of fraying, um, you know, and again, a lot of the other stuff too probably was, um, let's not forget part and parcel of the, the split that was happening with Roth as well. I mean, there wasn't just, you know, Ted fracturing and there was, there was a, there was a, 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 a kind of a double split going on there, but, um, you know, the album did get finished and <laughs> did sell 10 million copies. So it's like, you know, you don't want to know, you know, you know, no one wants to go to the hot dog factory, right? And see how the hot dogs are made. They just taste delicious. So let's just enjoy the delicious delicious album when it's finished and I think about the hot dogs. I have a few fan questions here. If we could fire through those uh, real quick. Sure. And I agree with one of these questions already. Push comes to shove. 
reggae is very big mm-hmm. at that time. Do mm-hmm. you think that was an influence on that? It's got a lot of reggae influence on it. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure it was. I mean, I think that's one of the things they um, they talked about. Uh, Roth was a, probably more than anybody else was the guy who was probably into that stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, that's another another thing that's really kind of cool about the sunset. I don't I don't think if you had, they had done that song at, at fifty one fifty, it would have sounded the same. There's that that room sound from that stuff on Fair Warning, which you know arguably is maybe the best. Along with the first album, the best capture of the of the, the sunset sound, room sound there, but um, yeah, definitely reggae influenced for sure. All uh, right, hey Greg Renoff, why the hell won't they let the open the floodgates of the vault? <laughs> <laughs> well, why the I, hell I won't they speak, let the open? The- I can't speak to that. I mean, I just think that um, for whatever reason, I think the band has been. I mean, the band meaning however we want to formulate that now, um, has been over the years very um, hesitant to release archival material. You know, where a band like Black Sabbath will regularly release two and three, four LP sets of with alternate takes and these types of things. I, I um, you know, I, I, some years ago, if I recall correctly, Alex made a comment sort of like, you know, the the original albums were were what we wanted them to be at the time. We worked really hard on them and that's kind of the way I think they should stand. I don't know if he still thinks that or that was just said in passing, but I, I mean, your, your guess is as good as mine. I, I um, you know, I, I have uh, long long advocated for uh, trying to release some of the, the things that are uh, stored away in the vault because I think there are really um, insightful things that would really uh, broaden the sense of what Van Halen is. All right. Mr. Renoff, when doing, when Ted was doing Dave's solo record, how pissed do you think the v, the VH brothers were? Do I get a rating system like very pissed, like sort of one to ten? <laughs> one to ten. When doing Dave's solo record, how pissed were the VH brothers? I, I, mean, I can't I can't speak to that. Um, I would just tell you that from Ted's perspective, what he told me was that because the making of 1984 had been so, um, let's just say, um, exhausting for everyone involved. That, and also that the, that he knew that there was some definitely some tension between Dave and the rest of the band. That he thought maybe one of the best things that could happen is that the band would take a bit of a break, with the hopes of maybe taking six months off and then coming back and reconvening, rather than trying to do what they had done, which was at the end of the year you go back in the studio. So that was the that was Ted's rationale for doing this, the four songs with Dave on the the EP. He said, I thought it was going to give them some breathing room. I mean, he's recently said that to me, some breathing room. He said, yeah. if I ever thought that it would have been something that would have fractured the band worse, I never would have agreed to it. He just, he said, I didn't, I think, you know, he would say that I didn't really see it as something that would be corrosive to the relationships. Um, and every band was doing solo album or solo work. Bands would do. Yeah, certainly some were. Yeah. He, yeah. he, he saw like, oh, okay, so Dave will do his solo project. It'll run its course by March. But, you know, the other thing I think it, that Ted would say is that when Dave started talking about the movie, doing a movie, Ted was really like, oh, I don't know. He, Ted, was, Ted was trying um, to not endorse that, so to speak. He thought that this was, he saw this as a, you know, as a potential problem. But basically, look, Ted wanted Van Halen to stay together. I think everybody knows that. So, you know, his thinking was, do this solo project, come back in March or April, make a record. Um, Ted was then, you know, by that point, Ted had already been sort of, um, Ed had already, I think probably Alex presumably had already kind of su- decided that Don was going to produce their next record and not Ted. And, uh, you know, even Ted has said, he's like, I, you know, to me, that was less important. He's like, you know, Don can produce them. That's fine. But I didn't want them to break up. He was like, you know, he was like, it was less important to me that I produce the next Van Halen record that those guys don't split up. Okay, moving on. Uh, if Ted didn't come down to the Starwood, would Van Halen still have broke through? Good question. If there was no Ted Templeman, would they have found a way to make it big? <laughs> in your opinion, what do you think, Paul? That's a that's a hard question to answer yeah. because uh, what if you know? Uh, what if? What if Jimmy Iovine found him? Yeah. Well. Yeah. You know, would they still have been as big as they are? Would have sounded more like Springsteen or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I think like you know, one of the people who uh, who supposedly was, right was given a heads up about Van Halen was Bob Ezrin, 
and he didn't, I suppose he never went to see them. I mean, I think, you know, I, I, I have very um, little doubt that, that in some formulation, Van Halen would have been able to, to have a career regardless of who produced them. I, I do, I think we all um, recognize that Ted and Don did something special with what they captured, that they didn't, you know, they didn't try to make the band sound like Foreigner or sound like, you know, a band that would have been much more sanitized. They made it, it sounded like, I mean, the album sounds like there were, <laughs> sounded like what was probably going on, that there was a lot of partying going on as they made the record and it just sort of captured a vibe. And so that was, you know, um, Ted just kind of wanting to roll tape and capture a performance, which was always, um, from the very first conversation I had with Ted, one of the things he always talked about, he's like, you know, you want to try to get it in the first couple of takes. You don't want to make someone do something over and over again because it just it just kills the kills well. They the were, you know, they were basically a live band yeah. recording. They they always recorded them live, right? And they just built the tracks up from there, right? Right. Because right. if you look at the invoices or you talk to people that were associated with the the records, they would start off the first week was just recording them live, right? And then then they go into overdub mode. Right. So they already got the song down, right? And a scratch vocal or something, right? And that was um, I think we talked about that before was that uh, yeah. Ted always talked about it. he said even if Roth didn't have the the lyrics together or something he always wanted Roth singing he's like you know very very rarely if ever did we ever track the instrumental stuff without dave singing because he said it was just part of the vibe he's like he'd have you know, dave in there doing his thing monkeying around while he sang even if he didn't have the lyrics down yet so um yeah that was the that was the uh you know different a different band maybe than the doobie brothers right which was you know something by the minute by minute album yeah. it's much more you know you're doing something kind of different the way you're building up the records but yeah it was just like let's roll the tape so Speaking of the doobies, so I have a question for you that I, I wanted to see if you could um, kind of extrapolate on a little bit more that I read in your book. It was kind of shocking that um, that they brought Michael McDonald in to help with a song um, on one of their records. Is that right? Well, they brought Michael McDonald in because Tom Johnson took ill. Yeah, no, but oh, was the Van Halen stuff. The Van, the Van Halen. Halen. Okay, so Van Halen. they brought Michael McDonald right. in to right, help right, with right, a right, riff right, right. on a song, and then shockingly, he realized he wasn't given writer's credit. This is true. I well, mean, time out on the. I don't remember this. Oh. Michael McDonald came into Sunset Sound. No, 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 no. no, no, no. Michael McDonald was brought in by Ted to help finish a song, and I don't know which Van Halen song. Do you remember which? Yeah. One? So. Um, what ended up happening was that one of the songs that um, Ed and Alex had worked really hard on was this, what became the song All Wait. And one of the, you know, going back to what we talked about with the, with writing and Van Halen, and Ted talked about, you know, that there was this instrumental thing that they had written, this, this piece of music, which was something that Ted wasn't crazy about and that Dave had tried to write a melody for and lyrics and was not able to finish it. But it, it, he said that it, it was obviously something that Ed really wanted on the record. It would have been the second keyboard, so jump and then I'll wait. So I, if I'm remembering correctly, Ted called Michael McDonald at the behest of Dave or something like Dave was like, I'm stuck and whatever. And then maybe Ted said, hey, you know, maybe we could bring Mike in. It's like, yeah, call him. And so they met at Ted's office um, at the Warner Brothers headquarters. Mike had a little keyboard, they had a boom box, he played the demo, mm -hmm. and that Mike McDonald wrote, the, basically wrote um, some of the lyrics and the chorus, particularly the chorus and the chorus melody, the I'll Wait part. There was a, uh, Mike sang it, and those guys heard that tape, and they were like, that's it, that's it, we've got it. And so, yes, but when the Van Halen 1984 album came out, the writer's credits didn't list Michael McDonald under All Wait, even though everybody knew who in Van Halen knew that Mike had, had worked on the song. So there was um, a couple of phone calls fielded and there was some, um, some back and forth and eventually that was rectified, I'll say that. I think that for Ted, um, you know, it was an uncomfortable situation. That wasn't something Ted was involved in. I mean, Ted didn't like write the, you know, write up the songwriting paperwork. I don't know. So you know. Michael didn't blame Ted then. Well, 
he did initially get angry and was like, how can these guys do this to me? Like, they, you basically, you called me. Which is, how can they do that? That's right. kind of interesting. Um, I don't remember that. So, yes, Ted, I think, said for a long time it was sort of an uncomfortable thing with him and Mike McDonald. And I think Mike eventually realized that, that Ted and Ted didn't have anything to do with how that they, those guys did that. That was their, you know, their, their publishing, however the writer's credit and the publishing work, that was their business. But, um, yeah, that was a, a definitely a, um, something that was kind of a, a left even, you know, a bad aftertaste in Ted's mouth after finishing this incredibly difficult record to make. It comes, you yeah, know, then you get this call. Deal from, with that. You got a call from one of your other, you know, artists who, you know, basically is being um, given a heads up by his attorney that, oh, by the way, you're not credited on this this song that you co-wrote, and uh, but it's uh, I think Mike McDonald joke said maybe they thought I was Santa Claus or something, and I just dropped a present down the yeah. chimney to them or whatever. But he's like, we fixed that, and so it, it was a rectified. But I, right. yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear it good. Yes, but it was. So if you look at the pressings now or the, the releases, out. yeah, it was, it was okay. yeah, it was another. I'm on my second round of the Ted book. What? Where is that at? And like a lot of love chapter. No, it would have been. So it would have been. Um, this would have been around the time that. Uh, that uh, Van Halen was breaking up, actually. Um, so this or, or, fourteen chapter. Yeah, break? it would have been. Well, it would have been. It would have been in early nineteen eighty four. Would have been a year before they broke up, but it would have been um, early nineteen eighty four after the nineteen eighty four album came out. <laughs> wow, that's amazing, Michael McDonald and Van. Yeah, Halen. I mean, and look, and the other point that's worth remarking is that this was this was kind of Ted's <laughs> trademark was that Ted was really really good about putting his artists together. I mean, he didn't do it a lot with Van Halen, a little bit with we talked about. With Nicolette Larson, Ed did the solo uh, on her um, her first album, but you know, uh, Little Feet played with Carly Simon. Uh, Mike McDonald did a song with Carly Simon, "You Belong to Me." I mean, Ted was really quite good at sort of working out these collaborations. Yeah, um, he knew what worked with who. Correct, and yeah. he would say, "Hey, you should get this person in." Um, Billy Payne from Little Feet played uh, piano on some of the Doobie stuff, and so he was. Um, this was kind of Ted's. Um, Trademark and sort of what he did. He'd be like, "Oh, we should get this person," and he was he was really good about that of kind of, of finding the people he knew that he thought could do the job. Paul, here's a question from for you, mm -hmm. Paul. On the Brian episode, do you still have the? Por this is funny. We were talking about this earlier, Paul. On the Brian episode, do you still have the Porsche you mentioned driving with Ed? If so, what model and year? <laughs> no, I was don't. It a Porsche <laughs> or a Ferrari? No, it was a Porsche. It was a it was a seventy seven nine thirty turbo. And, um, yeah, I mean, it was a very, back in the day, that was a very fast car. They used to call it the Widowmaker because uh, uh, yeah. the, the thing got tail happy and you could just be dead. No, Ed took me for a ride in, in my car that, I, I mean, it was frightening. <laughs> well, in fairness, it was a test drive. I mean, he was thinking about it, buying it. It was a test drive, but it was, like, in the middle of the road with traffic in both other directions and flying down at 80 miles an hour. What street? Uh, Coldwater Canyon, pretty pretty <laughs> scary <of> mountain. <laughs> yeah, for, uh, just off well, the mall. Put it through his paces. I mean, he yeah, he did. Him. Luckily, we didn't go off the edge. Did you tell him that story earlier? Because we were discussing Ted being scared riding in Eddie's yeah. Porsche when he'd pick him yeah, up. Yeah, he told did me. I, I talked to Ted uh, over the phone. Oh, wow. He was telling me about this horrific ride he had with uh, with, Eddie with Eddie, and he said, I'm never going to get in the car with him again. And I go, well, let me tell you about my story. And he, goes, <laughs> he goes, oh, you got one too? And I said, yeah, I do. Wow. So, anyway. All right, two more questions. We always say we're going to do 60 minutes, and then it's three hours. But this is great stuff. Oh, Brian Kihu question. <laughs> Seriously. Brian Kihu. Brian Kihu. We're going off Instagram Live. How much does the often told VH history repeat errors or myth? Like, what are some of the myths people had about their career? Oh, uh, wow. That's I mean, a great there's question. There's so many myths um, in Urban Legends. The well, one. I think, I think, wow, myths. Let me think of a, of a good thing to think about in terms of um, myths. I think that... They like played at the whiskey for like I mean sometimes a lot of the stuff would be like where they played um, you know one example might be like people would be like oh well they only played you know um, at the whiskey a couple times and then you look at the schedule and they played for the for a longer course of time um, that might be one another another one would be here's one for you that um, here there's that's a good one actually so um, with Van Halen two 
Van Halen 2 was not mixed at sunset. It was right. right. You know that, right? Yeah. But a lot of people are like, oh, well, they, they always did the whole record there. No. Right. They did it at Westlake. And um, there was a, a scheduling conflict. And that was actually, that's an interesting story because I, um, when Don mentioned that to me, I, I, I had either never noticed it on the liner notes or had forgotten about it or something. I was like, really? And I was like, oh, wow. He said, yeah. And he said that was one of the reasons why he, he says that Van Halen 2 sounds a little bit different than Van Halen 1. He said, I had never worked at Westlake before, and we were under a really tight deadline. And, you know, it, it, he's, his point was that Van Halen 2 might sound more like Van Halen 1 if it had been mixed yeah. at sunset. Because he didn't have availability of, of the echo chamber, the console, certain so, things he probably used. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, yeah. it's, um, I mean, a lot of people prefer... It, I shouldn't tell people. There's some people who prefer the sound of Van Halen 2 to Van Halen 1. And it's just it's just sort of a different thing. But yeah, that was a that's there's a good one. And I like that question for Brian. It took me a while to get to the right answer. But yeah, that's the one. Is that that was I think um, a fair warning. Women and children first. And I think I think Diver Down was mixed here too. I'm not 100 percent sure about that. Maybe it was mixed in Amigo. But um, that would be the, one of the big things. That yeah, that that um, you know, yeah. like the first for the first for the first four albums that everything was done at sunset. Not really not really true. Not true. Great question from Brian. We, there was a great comment the other day. We were talking with Danny White, Sound Techniques, about a legendary console and their new collaboration together. But the comment said, you guys are all great, but Brian's extraordinary <laughs> in speaking. Because he's just such he a is. knowledge of everything. You know, it's not just Van Halen. It's not just uh, equipment, outboard, consoles. He knows about everything, and he's yeah. so poetic. And is, he, is he like a match for you when you're talking about Van Halen where you guys can really talk about stuff because he's so up to par with you? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Yes, he is. He is. His knowledge is extraordinary when it comes to Van Halen. I, I will. I want to put this on the proper context. Um, Brian is also the guy who played keyboards with the Who for a leg of their tour in 2007, as well as his, he stepped in for uh, Rabbit Bundrick, who had to leave the tour. So. Um, you know, mm. Brian has a lot, yeah. a lot more uh, notches in his belt in terms of achievements in life, which is a pretty sure. cool thing that he got to do that. So, Recording yeah, the Beatles is, book. Yeah, Brian's an amazing, amazing guy. Been Round and wound, audio. Yes. People yes. don't know who he is sometimes. They just think he's like a Van Halen guy, but he's a legend in the music business. Um, he's great friends with all like the guys from Nirvana and all kinds of cool things. Great guy. All right, one more question. Well, let's. What's your guys' f favorite Van Halen song? Mine switched to Mean Street in the last year, which was Voodoo, Queen's on, Voodoo Queen on the demos. On the original Voodoo Queen, was the intro there, or was it just no, the, the hammer? No, the intro. The da -da, da -da, yeah, they da -da. just did the riff, yep. Okay, so they must have worked on that in studio. Yeah, that was that, that would be, yeah, that would be something I'd love to know more about how that, was, that yeah, intro was done. Do you know if that was done at Amigo or here? We think it I was think all here. of Fair Warning was, was done here, I believe, um, I, I could be wrong about that, but I believe almost everything on Fair Warning was done here, all of it. Yeah, I'd have to confirm it. We could look it up. <laughs> we got a lot of bets going on here. Gonna have to have a fact check. It's like yeah. mostly false or mostly true or something. Paul, what was the first song when you're out driving your car in 1978? What was the first song you heard from Van Halen? You're like, oh, those guys are in my studio. Do you remember? The first song that I liked. Running with the well, devil. I shouldn't say that I liked. The first song that... Um, really caught me was Pretty Woman. Really? Yeah, yeah. I really like that song. I mean, it, it's obviously it's a classic hit, but uh, I remember that that's the one they came in on like over a weekend and banged it out in Did this they room. Rush in here or something? It or? Was, they, they had to rush out a single. They didn't have an album, I think. Is I think you told the story. They didn't have an album. They needed, uh, Warner said, you got to get a record. I mean, you got to get a song out. So they did that and Happy Trails, I think. Right. They did that. Um, yeah. The interesting thing about that, too, with the, uh, they did that um, Intruder piece as well, which is that little instrumental thing. Yeah. And if you listen to that. It's the B-side of Pretty Woman, right? Yeah. It's, it, it feeds, it feeds, right, it feeds into Pretty Woman, and they, they needed more music for their music video. So they wanted to do a Pretty Woman music video, yep. and they realized that however they had storyboarded it out, they needed more music, so they did this instrumental thing. And actually, if you listen to that, there's keyboards being played, and that's actually David Lee Roth playing keyboards. So it's Eddie's playing really? guitar, like slide guitar with a beer can. Michael Anthony's playing bass, Alex is playing drums, and there's like this little kind of like spaghetti western type music. Da, da, da. Like that's David Lee Roth playing the keyboard. Yeah. Wow. As a live Trivia. take. A live take, yeah. 
Did like you know it. Unchained was written on piano? Uh, I think I did know that. I don't know which piano, but yeah, I think they d I did know that. Um, yeah, the, Go ahead. The, uh, the classic, the, the, uh, Ted Templeman appearance on the Van Halen record, and yeah, that's of course, uh, yeah, pretty much, if, I, if you're going to pick a favorite song for the average Van Halen fan, I, I think like that's going to be the winner in like a lot of, for a lot of people, like sort of like the hardcore, you know, like, I'm, I'm including myself in that, and I'm not certainly not saying that with any more than uh, anything less than reference for those people, but like, you know, rather than saying Jump or Panama, like the, the Unchained is usually in the top five or three for most people because of that, the riff and everything, you know. Mean Street, though, where, where does that lie in your top ten Van Halen? Yeah, I mean, I think... You know, for for that um, breakdown, I when I'm riding my bike, listening to that, I leave it on repeat sometimes. Yeah, yeah the so uh, unbelievable. The whole that whole album, in particularly, just how great Ed's guitar sound. I mean, you know, really, like I said it before, I think arguably that's the, I mean, arguably the best sounding of the first six Van Halen records. Um, it's just the uh, guitar sounds and the and the the drum sounds are so great on that record. And uh, yeah, that's up there for me. I, I you know, if I was going to pick a favorite. Um, Van Halen song at this moment. I'll, I'll go with I'll go with you know Running with the Devil. I'll say that as my favorite. I, that would change tomorrow. I I often change my mind on that. But um, you know that to me is such the. If you're going to introduce someone to Van Halen, I mean you're going to play him Jump or Running with the Devil. I mean I probably would start with Running with the Devil and then feed him Jump later. But yeah. yeah. First Van Halen song I ever heard was Why Can't This Be Love, mm -hmm. which my dad liked some of the Hagar stuff, but he didn't have the best taste in music. Uh, Mr. Renoff, what was Ted's pinnacle moment? Winning the Grammy for Doobie Brothers? Did he talk about that at all with you? I mean, briefly. I think he, you know, he had a lot of pinnacle moments. I mean, I think, I think for him, when he talked about winning the Grammy Award for the Doobie Brothers, he talked about how unexpected it was because the album, when it was finished, that band had just about broken up and in fact did break up. They broke up like just a few months, like six weeks after that album came out, they split and then they reformed. Some of the guys left, like Skunk Baxter left. So to have that be from, none of the guys, none of the guys really loved the album when it was done either. Like there was sort of like this general, like nobody was satisfied with it. And um, to have it be, sell through whatever, three million copies and have minute by minute become this um, dominant album on the charts. He said that was pretty, um, pretty amazing. Um, but you know, I think, I think, you know, the other um, pinnacle moments for, for Ted would probably be, you know, for him, he's always said like something like with like Nicolette and with the Doobies and then with Van Halen, he said, I really loved when I saw people who were pouring their hearts and soul into the music and they really weren't making any money and they were just, you know, were kind of doing it for, um, just for the love of it, to be able to enjoy that bit of fame. So I think, you know, he's like, especially like there was a party at, I don't know if he would say this is the pinnacle, but there was a party for Nicolette at uh, Warner Brothers. She loved to roller skate and they brought out a big cake. There's a picture of it in the book, a big cake with roller skates on it. You know, and he said like she went from being a background singer for Neil Young to being a girl with a gold record. He said it was like, it was incredible. You know, and yeah. I think for the Doobies, the same thing to have like, he said where the Doobies are in their little house in San Jose, this little hovel they lived in, eating cold, like so he said, like eating cold beans out of cans, like heating, you know, like they were that broke to being where they, you know, within two or three years had um, toured and had, you know, had uh, Black Water was number one. He's, I think those were the, the minutes for him as a, as a producer. Um, but, you know, Ted did some, as an artist, did some really cool things too. He got to play trumpet with Louis Armstrong um, when he was in Harper's Bazaar and he got to like be on television with George Burns. I mean, he got to do, you know, some pretty cool Stuff. I mean, there's some pretty, pretty fun clips of Ted on YouTube. If you look Harper's Bazaar, it's like, you know, it's a pretty, pretty. Uh, when style. he looked like Surfer Boy. Yeah, he's a yeah. Surfer yeah. Boy. Yeah. He had to tour with the Beach Boys, and so um, that was what was fun about doing the book. There were a lot of, a lot of things, but I think that's probably fair. I mean, I hard to speak for Ted, but I think that's a fair way to think about it. Was for him, he always said that was the most satisfying for people who were like, okay, like, like he said, like, you know, Eddie's couldn't close the door of his car. He was so broke, they had guitar strings wrapped around him to keep the door shut to be where he could afford a portion. I said that right. was like, satisfying for him. I'll yeah. bet. Amazing. I could sit here and talk with you all day, all night. You order pizza, set up little tents over here. <laughs> then you have to go to dinner, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you coming in. It was nice meeting you through Brian. I don't know, it was the nine months ago. Me, Paul, mm -hmm. Zoomed with you a few times. Mm -hmm. I've spoke with you on the phone. 
about Van Halen and other stuff. I think uh, your work has, you know, been recognized and people love it. It's so in depth, and you know, I, it's great that people have such accuracy from Ted Templeman too for the Ted book. You know, it's there's no other book Ted has. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> the, the volume two, the Ted, Ted outtakes. Yeah, yeah no, I uh, appreciate that. I appreciate the hospitality, <laughs> and uh, it was a true uh, thrill to come in here after um, years of reading and writing about this place it's uh there's a real a real sense of history and it was like i said it just it's just yeah it's it's incredible really is incredible so i really appreciate the hospitality oh thank you greg thank you so much for coming i loved your book i gotta tell you i learned more about ted than the 20 years you know by reading your book than the 20 years when cool that he came in here well thanks for saying that yeah I got to give a shout out to the van halen news desk i always see our interviews on there um they give us a lot of exposure. Do you know those guys that run that page? I do. I do. Good guys. Um, okay. Jeff Hausman has been a Van Halen fan for many, many years and, you know, has carried the torch through the good times and bad times of, you know, Van Halen's basically radio silence to the years when they're like touring. And so he's, yeah, a great, a great friend of mine and uh, does a really, really good job with the Van Halen News Desk. Um, next time we have to bring the jumpsuit in. Paul has the jumpsuit <laughs> from... <laughs> He has the Van Halen jumpsuit from 1984. His house. Yeah, from 1984, yeah. it's just hanging yeah. in his closet. We got we yeah. can do a whole episode on they that were jumpsuit. Gracious enough to give me one. That is cool. It won't fit anymore though. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if it did, you'd never you'd wear it every day. Yeah, to work. I could be wearing it every day. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of artifacts, we're all fans here. That's why we're doing this. We're not charging any subscription. We're just putting it up for fun. We want to investigate Van Halen. We have the work orders. We've printed a hundred of them, and you can go to sunsetsoundstore.com and use the code TED10, and that's going to get you 10% off one item, any item in the store. But the demo work orders are when they came in here and did the 25 tracks. We have that work order. It's a great thing for yeah. collectors, anything. You have one. I do. I've got one. Paul has the original. Um, and then I had one other thing. Oh, the book. Yeah, we wanted to mention the book. What's the title of the two books? So uh, Van yeah. Halen Rising. Yep, and uh, Ted Templeman, A Platinum Producer's Life in Music. And uh, yeah, they're both available at Amazon. Um, I can do signed copies. Just uh, hit me up on Twitter or whatever. You can find the link there. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's really been uh, just an incredible experience to come in here. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to talk to me about this stuff. And it's in, in this room is like of all places and the history here. It's amazing. That's awesome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Feeling groovy was cut here at sunset. We're going to go figure that out. Thank well, you. Everybody. That's, that's next episode. <laughs> okay. All right.